Well, good morning. So my name is Tommy Gober. I am a curriculum development specialist with cyber.org. Uh, Joe McAdam uh, here as well. Uh, so cyber.org, we are a, uh, a nonprofit funded by a grant from the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, DHS uh, has the CISA agency, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. And that is who funds everything that we do. So uh, our uh, favorite thing about what we um, what we like to tell folks is that we're all, everything we do is paid for. There's no catch, no gimmicks. Um, kind of like your access to the Virginia cyber range. Um, it's all been paid for. Um, so when you go to uh, cyber.org, um, you can kind of take a, a brief tour of the various curricula that we have to offer. Um, if you uh, go up to the very tip top here, if you go to sign up, uh, that's how you'll access um, or that's how you register for access to our curriculum. Um, the curriculum that you gain access to, we house on Canvas. And um, in Canvas here, we, um, uh, when you go to log in, it's got my old email address on here. Uh, this will show you all the different courses that we've got. And um, the, uh, the different courses that we have to offer of particular note is cybersecurity here. Um, though we do have other courses that are available. Um, the cybersecurity course that we offer is the one that use, makes use of the U.S. Cyber Range or Virginia Cyber Range. Um, and in fact, it doesn't require a, uh, a, any particular Cyber Range at all, but um, you guys are fortunate that you all have access to the Virginia Cyber Range uh, to use with this. Um, so, you know, often the question comes up is, uh, okay, I've got the range now, what do I do? Um, as you know, there are plenty of ready-made labs available for you. Um, on, uh, on our course, the cybersecurity course, we have uh, looked at different states' uh, standards, um, the lack of standards in many states, and uh, settled on um, tackling the CompTIA Security Plus certification. And if you're not familiar with that, um, we've got that housed right here in our course, the, the list of test objectives, and that's the content that's uh, tested on the, um, the Security Plus exam. Uh, this is for the, the 501. Uh, there is a new 601 coming out, version 601, um, due to be uh, to go live in November. So the, uh, and we'll be updating that accordingly. So as you scroll down on the uh, objectives here, you've got uh, six domains on the Security Plus exam. And uh, it goes over uh, those six domains. Those six domains are then broken up into um, sub uh, objectives or supporting objectives that are um, then uh, uh, further broken up into the, the content. So uh, for example, the, the first domain is threats, attacks, and vulnerabilities. Um, missing the Oxford comma there but I digress. Um, so 1.1 here says, uh, given a scenario, uh, analyze indicators of compromise and determine the type of malware. Okay, so it's, it's basically a, um, uh, a, a survey of the different types of malware that you've got available. Um, so then it breaks it up into these uh, kind of bulleted list of, of topics here. And then uh, going on 1.2, compare and contrast types of attacks, and then it explores various types of attacks that are out there. Um, a lot of the Security Plus, if you have not sat for it yourself, uh, a lot of it is kind of low-level Bloom's knowledge, understanding level um, questions. So there's a, a fair amount of just teaching the vocabulary, explaining the, the actions of what's going on there, um, just knowing the, the types of attackers that you've got um, out in the wild. So that's really what the Security Plus entails. Uh, this is all 1.6 and then uh, section two or domain number two is on technology and tools and so on and so forth. So what we've done is we've taken each of these bullet points that you've got here, um, each of these bullet points, and we have uh, created uh, PowerPoints that will guide you through um, each of these topics. And so the PowerPoint is kind of the lesson here. And um, so for example, we, we've got one on um, Trojans and rats. And so this would be the lesson for that. When you click on the uh, PowerPoint there, um, this kind of gets into explaining what is a Trojan horse and what's a back door, what is a rat, uh, what does a rat look like, and what does it give you access to do. Now, granted, some of these are uh, slightly dated um, examples of these, but um, the concepts remain. Uh, you know, a Trojan horse is something that we're um, all familiar with. With the um, 
with the, the Trojan horse lesson. So we've got the PowerPoint here for you, but what if you, you know, maybe you're not really very comfortable in leading a lesson on that. So we've got teacher notes here available for you. And when you open that up, this explains which lesson it goes with and then dives into explaining the, the concepts that are embedded in that PowerPoint. So kind of a, you know, a chapter summary of this to uh, help kind of shape your lesson for that topic. Um, that is uh, the teacher notes and the lessons that are available. And then uh, for the cyber range, we've got uh, labs that are available. Again, these labs do not, uh, they're not specifically targeting the Virginia cyber range, but uh, having the uh, Virginia cyber range resources at your fingertips um, definitely gives you a leg up on uh, the various labs that we've got. So these labs are uh, PowerPoints that you would download. So uh, clicking on like Trojan uh, lab number two, um, as you go through here, this uh, explains what sort of materials you need, the objectives that map back to that security plus, um, and then explaining just real briefly if, if the students haven't really gone through that lesson of what is a backdoor, we kind of explain that and explain what a Trojan is. And then uh, we actually get into the, the lab environment where you are setting up uh, the different examples. Um, and this one we're using uh, dual um, dual environment. So you've got Kali and then uh, the Windows 7 uh, target that's on there. Uh, and then you're going through and just kind of walking through setting up uh, a backdoor attacking um, the Windows machine uh, by creating uh, malware and then um, using Metasploit on that and then exploiting that to carry out some kind of action on the um, on the target system. So um, what this will do is just kind of give you a backdoor. But, if, but from that point, then you can grow and start to get into some of the other activities that we've got, like uh, key loggers, um, and um, you can do um, the privilege escalation that's down here, uh, pass the hash, all sorts of other labs then build on these um, early labs of just kind of creating some malware. Once you've got that back door open, um, as you probably know, then you can really, really uh, take off with the different types of exploits that are available to you. Um, we'll be doing a, a full kind of dive into all of these tomorrow afternoon um, in, in the afternoon session, just kind of looking at a, a really big overview of the course. But this is all the content that, um, that we've got. We've got uh, content for each of those bullet, bullet points that are in the, um, the course. And you're looking at this going, wow, Tommy, that looks like a whole lot of material. Uh, I can't believe you guys think that we're going to cover all this stuff in class. Um, we do because a lot of this material is very short. So I showed you the, um, the ransomware and, and, uh, or the Trojans and rats. When you uh, go to any of these PowerPoints, you'll see that they are not uh, necessarily very long um, lessons on these. So this is what a keylogger is. This is what it looks like and what kind of keystrokes, you know, so you have, here's an email. And then this is what the, um, the key logger might capture on this. And then how do you prevent it? Okay, so there's three slides in this one lesson. That means that you can take this and either join it with a lab and make it you know, a full day of just that. But really what I would do in my course is I would probably combine several of these uh, lessons together and, um, and build up uh, a, a single day's worth of, of content um, using knocking out five or uh, four or five of these different topics. Because several of them are just, oh, I didn't know that was the name of that type of thing, or I didn't know that that's how it works. But now that you've explained it, I've got it, and then we can move on. Um, for, for example, denial of service, um, we've got a lab for this one, and this is one of the ones that um, it's, uh, the PowerPoint itself is mostly this kind of animation that's set up on here. So, um, you know, here's an example of kind of uh, how a, a, an NTP amplification denial of service works. And so I would say, you know, the, the attacking uh, botnet might talk to a member and, and say, hey, ask what time it is. And then the, the time request then goes to each of these uh, time servers that are out there. And then they all will then respond and attack a target. And of course that will um, happen many, many times more than just three times per member. But of course that's enough to make the, uh, the target sizzle there a little bit. So um, that's, the length of this of this PowerPoint, this one, otherwise you're looking at, it's what, five slides long on denial of service. Um, uh, 
uh, a very simple concept to understand, uh, but actually carrying it out might take a little bit more time. And so we've got a lab for that. Um, as we scroll down here, uh, not every uh, topic has a, a lab to go along with it. Um, router and switch security, that would be something that's a little bit harder to pull off on the Virginia Cyber Range or looking at um, load balancers, setting something like that up. But uh, definitely doable. It's just something that we don't have uh, labs for each of those. And then we've also got built in here uh, case studies. And so you can dive into, um, you know, looking at uh, one on malware here, for example. These case studies are meant to provide students a way to see these concepts in the real world um, where, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading about malware and I'm learning about malware and you know, who makes this stuff and wh where does it come from? Um, and so this, this uh, lesson, uh, this case study comes uh, from the, the case of Marcus Hutchins um, who created the Kronos malware, but he's also uh, uh, more widely known as the guy who helped stop the WannaCry um, malware. And so uh, he got a lot of positive press for helping stop the WannaCry attacks. But when he came to the U S to defend, um, to attend uh, DEF CON, he actually got picked up by the U S federal authorities and they penalized him for, um, uh, for, uh, they, they charged him with creating the Kronos malware, uh, before he ever did this good deed of helping stop the WannaCry attack. And so then it uh, dies in this kind of legal gray area or, or some of these questions that we want students to reflect on, um, these kind of questions. So, you know, should it be legal to create malware? W what if you ever actually use it? Um, is, you know, is that still an illegal act or, or not? Um, what is, you know, how would a uh, malware be defined legally? Um, should it be legal to sell malware to others? Um, right now, these are, it, it's kind of a gray area because it's hard to say what exactly malware is, especially if it's never been used. Um, it is illegal to access someone else's system, but the actual act of authoring it, um, kind of hard to say. Um, should a judge consider a uh, person's good deeds um, if they've committed a crime, uh, nevertheless? And then, um, you know, should he or should he have not received jail time um, or fines for creating this Kronos malware? Things that we want students to, to see, where does cyber law apply to these kind of cases? Um, what, uh, you know, what am I up against if I decide to uh, put on that black hat um, when it comes to, to hacking and, and using my knowledge for, um, for malicious uses? Um, going down here, we've got uh, other case studies on logic bombs, botnets, uh, steganography, you name it. Um, several case studies scattered throughout the course. Again, it's all reflecting back on um, cyber law. Speaking of cyber law, we've got three uh, appendices that are on here that are not necessarily required by the Security Plus exam. Um, uh, the first one being, uh, well, I'll do them in reverse order here. So we've got Appendix C, which is legal considerations. You can think of it as cyber law. Um, just a brief overview of the, and this is a, a, um, a longer PowerPoint to kind of cover some of this, but um, covering some of the other uh, major landmark cases that come up in cyber law, um, looking at specifically the Patriot Act, um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, that comes up here, Electronic Communications Privacy Act that um, has um, had several different um, imp uh, iterations throughout the years. Federal Wiretap Act, uh, this is actually what they uh, used with the Kronos malware case study that we just looked at. Um, and, and what does that have to do with, um, you know, what does wiretapping have to do with cybersecurity? Uh, FISA, FISA court orders that we've uh, may have heard about. Um, and then this recently got uh, updated. And then um, probably most recently is GDPR, something that we've all heard about. Interesting thing about GDPR is even though you may not be an, an EU uh, citizen, uh, or a constituent, you are still uh, a recipient of the uh, the benefits. I guess you still benefit in some uh, in some kind of tangential way of how GDPR uh, reflects um, on businesses and how businesses respond to customer requests. Um, you you know you may have seen several years ago when everybody it seemed was sending out these emails saying you know we're retaining your data you have the right to opt out or something like that um, all of those emails that was because of GDPR so even though you don't live in the EU perhaps uh, you uh, are still uh, impacted by cyber law so several slides on uh, GDPR and then also DMCA 
that is the, uh, the cyber law or what we're calling our legal considerations PowerPoint. We've also got an overview of networking terminology, terms, uh, understandings, uh, going through the OSI um, uh, seven layer network model. And um, you know, here's all the different vocabulary that we've got, the OSI model viewed different ways. And then of course you go through each of the, uh, the layers explaining what they do and then uh, how they all interact as the data transfers. Um, all of these with the purpose of understanding what the heck is an IP address, what's a MAC address, what's the difference, when do I use one or the other? Um, and it's, it's a lot of, you know, just knowing, oh, that's the name of that, or that's what a valid IP address is. Um, so uh, also how does DNS work and, and so on. So that is the networking overview. And then also we've got the Linux command line. Again, so you've got access to the Virginia cyber range. Um, we're gonna be making use of the US cyber range today once uh, everybody gets their uh, uh, courses spun up in there. Great, I've got access to this range. What the heck do I do? What is Linux? Why do I need to use Linux? Um, so we've got this uh, Linux 101 um, lab that we've got set up on here. Uh, we've got uh, actually a four part uh, series that we do at cyber.org, Linux 101, 102, 103, and 104. Um, each of those kind of walk you through a deeper and deeper dive into the Linux operating system. Uh, 101 is basically moving around the Linux uh, file system, knowing where files are, copying files, moving them uh, from one point to another. 102 gets a little bit deeper into that. Um, different ways to interact with files using less, more, uh, redirection, which we'll be making use of today a little bit. And then uh, 103 and 104, we're actually doing this week, uh, tomorrow afternoon, I believe, not to necessarily coincide with this event, but um, Linux 103 is tomorrow and then 104 on Thursday. Um, so, um, let's see here. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the Linux materials that we've got in here. We've also got built in this Linux cheat sheet. I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is something you can download. In fact, um, uh, a good resource to have uh, just kind of explains what all the different Linux commands are. You've probably seen some cheat sheets very, very similar to this. Um, they're, they're just about all the same. They kind of cover the same basic getting around um, commands that you need on here. So um, lots of good stuff uh, embedded in the course itself. Uh, we've got them all in here. Joe, we are missing our uh, our Linux fun activity. We, Joe just cooked up a, a some the, the lighter hearted goofy stuff, I guess. Um, we'll that up later. I don't know where that went. Yeah, it should be right underneath that. So it'll be up uh, right after this workshop, this, uh, workshop. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll throw that out there. Uh, so check it out uh, later today um, when you guys all get access to this. So the Linux fun stuff is just kind of going through uh, what all we got in there. Calsay, uh, lolcat. Um, we got a little. Matt, we LS with or SL with the train going through. We've got, we turn your Linux machine into an aquarium. Just all sorts of learning. <laughs> by having fun it's not the most time efficient but uh learn some uh linux commands just by some funny uh applications so. and we we discovered that um the 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 kind of the tack that we're doing on that uh, as we're going through some of our different workshops we would show a couple of these and then teachers are saying like hey my kids would actually enjoy knowing that because we would go off on a little rabbit trail uh showing some of these stupid commands and um and so Anyways, kind of Joe packaged all that into a Linux fun um, uh, activity that we've got there. Um, strolling around here too, I wanted to, I'll come back to this little book portion down here. Uh, I wanted to show you the student acceptable use policy. This is an example PDF um, form. If your school perhaps is a little uh, wary of your uh, kids actually doing any of these kind of um, attacks on an environment or something like that, uh, this is just kind of a boilerplate um, acceptable use policy if you don't have one set up already. Um, and so uh, this will go through and uh, you know you put in the, uh, the school's name on here, the students then fill out their portion and um, uh, or, or the, and the parents uh, sit down with them and they kind of go through looking at all of the responsibilities on the students portion. And then they sign the agreement saying that you know they're going to use this uh, for good and not for bad. Uh, and then they would uh, it's a two-part page. They would bring you back the second page um, 
with the first page being the agreement that they retain. And so you've got access to that. And then you say, okay, well, like you signed off on that here on the second page. So um, anyway, so that's uh, something handy for you to use. That's the acceptable use policy up here at the top. Your school may already have something like that. If so, by all means use that. Um, we just have that as an example. Uh, and then down here, we've got the, uh, the book. So if you want to keep your students engaged beyond uh, the classroom, um, I want them doing something. Grab my copy of this book over here. Got to reach for it. Um, so the, the book that we're uh, looking at is uh, uh, Worm by Mark Bowden. And uh, this is the author of Black Hawk Down. Um, good book. I probably should have got a copy with the dust jacket on there. Um, the... Uh, make it look a little more appealing. Um, but as you go through this one, we've got some chapter questions that would guide students along through it. And then the answer key, I'm going to go ahead and show you the answer key This basically um, the, the answer key is provides these kind of red text on here so that you kind of see. Uh, so the black is the question that the students have, and then they have blanks uh, down below it. This kind of gives you an example of what sort of stuff you would want the students going for on those answers. Um, so uh, here, question two, the author says that Phil has come face to face with the glaze. What is the glaze? How can a person avoid seeing the glaze when explaining how a system works? And then the answer that we're kind of getting after here is that the glaze is when a, somebody kind of, you know, glazes over, they, they get a confused, uninterested look in what someone is telling them about a computer system, usually because they're not able to follow the person, whatever they're, whatever they're being told to them. Seeing the glaze can be avoided by explaining things in an interesting manner and in a way that the, the person can understand. You know, it's all about context. So um, letting people, letting students know, okay, when you're explaining this kind of stuff, you can overwhelm someone easily and, um, you know, uh, less talk, more action, which is a great segue into doing some activities here. So I'm gonna stop talking here in just a moment. Uh, the book itself is called uh, Worm, The First Digital World War. Here's the author. Uh, and we've got the ISBN numbers uh, for both the hardback and paperback. Those chapter questions are all 11 chapters are covered here on this one document. And uh, to split it up, I would just say, you know, print to PDF of whatever page you wanna do and you can hand it out to the students that way. So that is the, uh, the book exercise that we have here. Um, we've also got descriptions of all the labs and the case studies that are up here at the top. Teaching guide kind of explains what I just talked about here. And then last little bit here, um, still not completely posted here are the quizzes. Uh, we've got a key for the different types of malware. And uh, those, this is the key here. We have the correct answers uh, identified with the, uh, the asterisks that are on here. Um, so a computer slowing down could be a sign that it's a, uh, that it's, uh, it is malware infected. And that would be a true. And so that shows an A here. If you are making use of an LMS like Canvas or Moodle, Schoology, Google Classroom, you name it, um, we've got this uh, QTI format. And this is actually the holdup on, all the, on posting the other questions that we've got. The, uh, the QTI format, it's an LMS data format. So you can download that zip file, mm -hmm. upload those questions right to your LMS. It'll create automatically graded quizzes for you in your LMS of choice. Um, it's a great resource for you. It's the same thing as the key uh, and the quiz. It's just going to jumble the answers and the questions around so you can um, uh, create kind of unique test uh, environments for the students. We've got about 10 questions per topic on here. And again, you've only got three or four slides per topic, yet we've got 10 questions out there um, regarding that. So you can take multiple uh, lessons to form a day's topic. And then um, you'll have, you know, let's say you do four lessons, quote unquote lessons, four PowerPoint topics in a day. That means you've got about 40 questions to draw, draw from for the students on that day um, to, uh, to pull multiple of those courses together, uh, questions together. So lots and lots and lots of content on here. The, the price is right, it's all free. Um, you get access to it. We, like I said, we will be updating the content going through uh, for 601. That'll be uh, towards the end of the year. Um, you'll see that um, uh, 601 content will all be going live, but lots of 501 here. Um, Eileen says that uh, she registered for the, uh, for access to cyber.org, get access to all this. Um, <laughs> what the heck? It's going to take three to five days. No, that's just a uh, kind of a, a, a 
common response. It's a kind of automated response there that you'll be getting. Um, we will be talking to folks back at the main office and they will uh, be getting you access today. So uh, any questions on the content before we dive in? That way I'm not having you experience the glaze. <laughs> Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate, Tommy, that um, there's a lot of the labs um, and kind of lessons up on uh, that you guys have access to from the Virginia Cyber Range um, under the courses up there. And that is um, great resources. We've just taken a lot of those lessons and uh, or I should say labs from that. We've kind of repackaged them. We'll give credit to the person who made it and then um, put it in a nice, what I find a more friendly or friendly PowerPoint. Uh, but then we also have some labs that are unique to us. And then we also have all the other lessons to kind of go along with it that align to that security plus and they can take it from there. So um, a lot of this does align to those, but in our own unique way. So, yeah, so um, lots of stuff here. Um, Mark says in the past, uh, he, he knows that uh, you have to be a teacher to get access to it. Um, that is true uh, per the grant. We can only give this to uh, us teachers. Um, and uh, Mark says that he's the director of education for the Cyber Center for Education Innovation. Um, yeah, so we can uh, we can wave you in, I believe, and uh, and grow all of this. Um, we can certainly, uh, you know, we'll we'll review each of those cases. If you get any kind of uh, if you get any kind of pushback from uh, the folks at the office, let us know in that, um, and you know, we'll we'll kind of help guide that process. So, um, anywho, uh, so yeah, Mark, uh, stay in touch there. Um, and you got your email address there. I'll share mine here for you and others. Um, Hey, there's Chuck. Um, so, uh, there's my email address. If you guys, whenever you, um, sign up, if you, uh, if you hear anything about that, we'll get in touch with it that way. Okay. So that's a lot of content, obviously. Um, we could go on more about this. We'll be diving into a little bit more tomorrow. Um, so uh, let's see, are you are we ready to kick off? You wanna dive in? How's everybody looking, Joe? Everybody get into the US cyber range? Oh, got so you on mute. There we go. Um, so two people signed up a little late, but they should warm up by the, hopefully by the time that um, I get through my little intro slides to explain what we're doing, we'll be good to go, so. Um, okay. Chuck has been lurking in the background, apparently. <laughs> so as in the middle when of you get access to the uh, to the um, the environment that we've set up on here, you'll see that uh, we put the cyber.org uh, wallpaper on here. Whenever you open a terminal, um, you'll see the cyber.org um, message of the day file come up there. But other than that, you'll see that it, it appears that everything is the same. What we've done in this environment, we're not going to dive off into it, but um, as part of kind of getting students set up and, you know, accessible or uh, used to commission commands and interacting with files, we put some text documents out here. It's just some public works, um, 20,000 links under the sea, Sun Tzu's Art of War, Great Gatsby, et cetera. Um, and how you can interact with that. And then we've also pre-installed uh, DVWA. Um, we've got a, a lamp set up on here for web applications and whatnot. So just to make sure that all of uh, our environments today are all set up the same. That's why we had you do the US cyber range. But again, everything we do, it's actually working on the Virginia cyber range. Uh, it's just, we have been using this with teachers across the country. So what is our first? Um, yeah, so we're gonna walk through um, kind of a, a cross-site request forgery lab. Um, so it was really difficult for Tommy and I to kind of prepare for this because what we normally do um, in these workshops um, is kind of things that are available within that sort of Virginia Cyber Range content, um, but we put our own little flavor to it. Um, so we had to think, well, like, what do we have that's not up there? And uh, two labs that we think are really good that are going to be good to be shown in workshops are the kind of our twist on the cross-site request forgery, which does use DVWA, which I know is used a lot within the um, Virginia content. Um, so we have our own cross-site request, which I've never seen up there. I think it's really powerful and a really powerful one to show. And then the other one that Tommy will be leading us through later, there, there's a ton of password cracking, and David Raymond or Dr. Raymond and 
um, tweaks to a lot of password cracking um, with the brute force using like John Ripper and other type of tools. And we have lessons with that, but we have a, a unique lab with rainbow tape using rainbow tables to crack them. Um, and we'll kind of show you how um, it almost works like magic. We like to say sometimes, um, obviously it's not, uh, but Tommy will be walking us through that in the afternoon and uh, how powerful that is because it, it's in my opinion, much more powerful than a, a brute force attack. So uh, can get some, but those are the two labs that we'll be walking through for the next hour, hour and a half. Um, we're assuming you guys have dealt with the Virginia cyber range before. If you haven't, that's okay. We sh you, you're not gonna be that far behind, but we're assuming you have. Um, we're gonna be dealing everything with um, the, the dual environment today that has that vulnerable windows and um, Kai Linux. And I know they just updated the um, that, it, environment within the Virginia cyber range um, to be the 2020 version and uh, we're it'll be next month that we roll out with that when we start making our image so we'll we'll be caught up on that here within next month but this is our own image like Tommy said there's very few differences that we've changed from the vulnerable windows um, within the Virginia cyber range the vulnerable windows in the Cali uh, Linux environment um, like our background we installed DVWA nothing too crazy though okay uh, but let's go ahead and get fired up I'll share my screen here um, we, Joe, while you're doing that real quick, I wanted to answer Eileen's question. Uh, she said, uh, you know, Hey, we're using Chromebooks. Is this going to work for us? Uh, it does work in, on Chromebooks. We've, um, had several folks going through using Chromebooks. Um, the only thing is whenever you need to right click on something, use two fingers to, uh, click on the Chromebook and that should give you the, any of the pop-up windows. Uh, but the, uh, you know, everything's coming through the browser, uh, through this kind of conduit. Uh, for the Virginia Cyber Range, or in this case, the U.S. Cyber Range. Um, that's all going through Chrome. Uh, that's what we like to use uh, for this. And on a Chromebook, you know, you're just using Chrome as well. So that conduit is still the same. The only thing different is if you're going to right-click, make sure you're doing that two-finger click. You'll be good to go. Um, so I just kind of see people warm up. Kenneth, uh, Octavia, and I think I had one more just request. I'm sorry that it's um, maybe taking a little bit of time, but it looks like just you two. Um, hopefully you get those fired up soon and can kind of go. I know this session is being recorded, so if something's wrong, you can always go back and uh, rewatch what it looks like uh, Katrina as well. Um, sorry, but it looks like everybody else is in. We have some other names from uh, other workshops that we've done that have used this environment. Um, hopefully we're all in. Um, I see people in our ranges. We are going to be using both the um, Kali and Windows environments. So I have my Kali environment open here. Okay, kind of has the cyber.org in the bottom right. I'm not sure how much we've all used these two um, environments. Um, the, when I say environments, the two uh, operating systems in this range where we have the, the windows, the vulnerable windows, they call it, and then the Kali Linux. Not sure how much we used it, but um, I hope we all know they are um, connected, but they can't access the outside world, so we can't attack anything outside this little bubble, and we'll talk more about that here in a second. Uh, but this is my Kali image. It should look just like this when you load it up. It just kind of has our background on here. And then here's my Windows. When you first open Windows up, if you've never done the Virginia Cyber Range, just click that you don't want to activate it. Um, we're not going to activate the Windows. We're going to, uh, that would allow it to start updating and stuff, which I don't even think they update Windows 7 anymore. Um, but we're not going to deal with that. So skip past the activation. Don't do that unless you want to pay for it. Um, Let's see here. So we have this. So what we're going to run through today, so let me load that up here, is um, cross-site request forgery, okay? Um, it is, we have two of them up on our website, and I think uh, Virginia Cyber Rings actually somewhere within the content has another one. It's a little different, but we, we like our little flavors of the two. Um, but what is the cross-site request? Well, it does use that DVWA. Um, I don't know how many of us in here have ever used that before. Uh, but it's a web application. You can think of the web application, something like Facebook, or maybe your bank account. With I, I use Chase, so maybe my, when I log into Chase Bank account, I'm kind of in the web application there, um, and some other ones. But we're going to show basically how to basically forge um, a request, a um, little Git request, and it is going to do it in the background without us ever seeing it, and kind of change a password for that web application, uh, which is kind of kind of dangerous, but cool to see. I'm kind of show you how to defend against it and what to do to. Um, kind of stop this attack. So that's kind of a, um, a thing that we like to do is not only show how it's done, but also how to stop it. And we'll talk about at the end um, how to kind of make sure this doesn't happen to you. So, okay. Um, so what is the cross-site request forgery attack? 
Um, so basically, it's going to uh, reuse a request, or it's going to basically hide this request somewhere where the user is not going to see it. And we're doing this bottom right one where we're going to make um, a website that all, literally all it's going to do is have a little banner like this. Let me actually blow this image up. Um, we're going to have a little banner, and all it's going to do is show that. Welcome to this website. Obviously, we could go through and make a whole website. People have done this with games before. They'll make a game and pass the game around to their friends. Well, actually, in the background, what's not being shown is this is actually going to be changing the password for this DBWA application over here. So the Windows user is going to be using this and not realize that in the background of loading this very simple website without being shown or anything, it just changed their backward and changed their backward, changed their password in the background. Um, kind of cool to see a lot of times we get like, oh man, that's kind of scary when we're done with this. Um, we'll kind of show you how to stop it. Um, today we'll just be changing a password within DBWA, but as it says down here, like what can be happen or what can happen other than change a password? We'll say I was logged in my bank account. What's um, stopping the person from setting up a request to transfer money um, from that bank account to another? Um, transfer private data. What if I got into the school's database and we have all that kid's data just have it emailed to somebody else real quick or something like that? So that's where it turns even more dangerous in the real world. Um, who is who? One thing we like to talk about in our labs is who is who. Um, today, anytime that you're in the Windows 7 machine, um, when we're inside of that um, desktop right there, um, you're going to be the victim at that point. You don't know what happens or you're not really sure what's happening. You're not the malicious user. You're just the victim there, the unknowing victim of what's happening. The malicious attacker is that's every time we're in the Kali Linux machine. Anytime we're in the Linux machine, you're kind of putting on the hat of that attacker. You're trying to maliciously attack that Windows 7 machine. Um, so just remember that every time we do that, and I'll kind of try and walk us through um, as we flip back and forth between Windows and Kali. I know that gets confusing. Um, remember, those are two different machines. You can kind of picture it as maybe I'm the malicious attacker here in Ohio. And if I'm attacking Tommy's machine, he's down in Texas. We're not normally next to each other, kind of like it is here where you're going to have them open in the same ground. Uh, what is Linux? Um, Tommy kind of touched upon that and why we use it. Um, it's just a great tool. Um, the the free and open source um, one that we always like to say. But uh, more importantly, what's Kali? It's the little distro of the Linux that they used for a lot of pen testing. I hope a lot of us have seen that for for inside this, uh, um, the Virginia side range and why they use um, Kali a lot of times or other sort of flavors. But um, Kali is great because it comes with all these tools pre-installed. Yes, you can put them on other systems, but a little nice when they're already there. Um, so we are using the U.S. Cyber Range Day. You can kind of just picture or replace the U.S. with VA, and it's the same exact thing except different name. Um, it's repackaged for all the other teachers in the world. You guys are just very, very fortunate where you get it for free if you're from Virginia. Um, the rest of the teachers in the world are very jealous of that. Um, but how does it work? Well, this can be my range here. I might see Angela here. This could be her range, and this could be Eric's range. Um, we can't attack each other. I don't know if you guys have dealt with the dual environment before, but we cannot attack each other. Okay, so if you try and basically access my website today, when we type in our IP addresses, you're not going to be able to do it because we aren't talking to each other. Okay, I uh, hope you guys know the Virginia or Virginia Cyber Range and or the US Cyber Range is located on kind of Amazon servers here, all right, which do give us access to the outside world. But do note that the kids are protected on this. Um, I don't know what our comfort level with the range is, but um, if you've been with them before, you know that you can attack the outside world. Um, it kind of keeps both the school and the kids protected um, from doing something even on accident or maliciously. So um, just know that um, your Kali and Windows machine are connected within this little bubble, but you can't attack anything outside. Okay. Um, so how are we going to complete this lab today? What are we going to do? Um, I do have in red and green here kind of the greens that when we're on the Windows machine. Um, red's the malicious user on the Kali machine. Sorry if you're colorblind. I, I ran into this problem uh, a couple of weeks ago running a workshop time and I did. Um, apparently for colorblind, you're not able to see the differences, but we kind of have green's the good guy, red's the malicious user here. Um, so basically we're gonna start DBWA servers. Um, those are located on the Kali machine. Uh, we don't have to picture that, um, we don't have to think like, oh, well then the malicious user is hosting that, um, the DBWA files, kind of picture those as just out there. They just happen to be on the Kali machine. Um, after that, we're gonna go to the windows and we'll log in to the application. We're just going to change the security to low on DBWA, but we're going to show you how to change a password. We're going to log out, make sure the password was actually changed. Nothing crazy. We've done this a million times with um, what other web applications in the real world, like we've changed our Facebook password, Google password, all sorts of different things. Okay. After we do that to kind of prove that we can change the password and things, at that point, the malicious user has no idea what the password is to DBWA. The Windows user has changed it. Well, we're going to start scanning for network activity using Wireshark. Um, 
from the Kali end. Very simple. We're just going to capture the get request is really what we're looking for. Um, we could go run DBWA and see how the get request works, but we're just going to kind of show you that you can kind of capture it and see it um, over the, the kind of when packets are being transferred to the arrow. Okay. Um, after we start scanning, we're going to have that Windows user change the password. The Kali guy is going to see this password change request and we're going to capture it. Okay. After we have it, we're going to create a malicious web page using that request. And we create this request. Uh, we'll kind of show you how it works, how simple it is, um, and how kind of scary it is. And we will make this super simple website. Then the background changes that request. After that happens, uh, we're going to have the Windows user actually go visit this web page um, without them knowing the password is going to change in the background. Okay. Um, when it changes, all of a sudden the malicious user now has access to that web application and not the um, not the victim. They aren't going to know their password once they log out. Uh, we can kind of access this application from the tally end and you can see it. But long story short, the um, malicious user is going to capture the get request of how to change the password. Uh, they're going to create that um, web page. And then we're going to get the victim to kind of access it. You can do this via an email, like, hey, go check out this link or something. And when they do that and they go to that link, it's going to change their password in the background. And all of a sudden, the malicious user then has access. Okay. That's kind of what we're going to run through. Um, tools that we are going to use, DBWA, we keep talking about, that's going to be our web application. Um, it allow, it's a great web application if you've never used it before. I don't know what everybody's level is with it. Um, but basically, they have <clears throat> this web application. It can be like Chase Bank. But what happens if we start taking some of the security features away? What happens if we take them all away and we go back to before everything was patched? <clears throat> um, that's kind of what this web application allows you to do is mess with the security settings. And so you're able to test and show different attacks. Uh, what is XAMPP? Well, these are the kind of servers we have on the, the Linux end, and they're just going to host all the DBWA files. And we'll show you how to fire that up here in a little bit. Uh, Wireshark is a great network monitoring tool. I don't know if you've ever used that before, once again. Um, it has a great um, graphics interface. Um, you can kind of just monitor all the packets and see what's going on. And then finally, um, we get a little crap from this from higher up people, but we use LeapPad in our workshops. Um, it's just for the sole thing of we don't know what people's levels are. Um, you can use a nano editor, um, the Vim editor, whatever you want to use. Um, we use LeapPad here just so it looks familiar to everyone if they're only used to like a WordPad or something. Okay, but that's kind of the text editor we'll use to make that HTML page for that. Uh, lastly, if you want to follow along, um, this is our CSRF2 lab. Um, it aligns with lesson 1, 2, 13. So let me go there. So if you get access to our content here, 1.2.13 is our kind of CSRF um, lesson here. You can do the lesson. Uh, there's PowerPoint there. Teacher notes kind of walk you through it, like Tommy said. But the lab here, the CSRF2, is what we're going to be running through right now. So if you have access to our Canvas or in the future, if you want to load up this exact lab, this is where it's going to be hosted right here um, under that CSRF2. Um, when you do that, keep it open on my side, not trying to hide anything from you. Um, here's what the lab will look like and kind of walk through. And Tommy, did you show this one when you walked through? I don't remember. Sorry, I was answering questions. <laughs> uh, I honestly don't remember which one I clicked on. <laughs> but I mean, it kind of shows like um, powerful part here is like when we start creating that request form, it kind of walks you through how to do that. And nope, stuff. didn't do that one. All right, didn't do this one. So this is kind of what we're going to uh, be walking through. But I'm going to walk us through it kind of like the teacher would in the classroom and kind of show you how it's done. Um, what I need from everybody right now is let's make sure we have the Kali machine open. And in another tab, we also have our Windows machine open. Um, just blank desktops right now. Uh, do remember anytime you're in the Windows, you are the victim. Anytime you're in the Kali, you're going to be that malicious user. Okay. We're going to kind of show how this attack works and also how the Windows um, user could have defended themselves against this attack. Uh, let me go into my range here. Uh, looks like everybody's in except for Katrina. I'm really sorry, Katrina. Hopefully that fires up soon. Um, everybody else able to get in though? Any other questions? Yeah. Well, no questions. Uh, please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, let's go ahead and get started and actually run through this lab. Okay. Um, if you remember what our first step is, is we got to fire up that um, basically the XAMPP servers, the DBWA files, and let's get that application working. So if we were going to try and access the DBWA website from the Windows side right now, that's not going to work. Um, the DBWA files, we have them um, in uh, a location where we like to have it. And we have um, the servers kind of here installed. Um, if we go ahead and open a terminal, um, terminal, let's go ahead and open it down here at the bottom middle. Um, little black box down there. You can also, there's a bunch of ways we can open it as we've learned. You can click applications in the top left and see the terminal emulator right there and open it as well. But let's go ahead and open a terminal. 
I'm going to like, um, blow this up so you guys can kind of see it a little better. I cyber.org goes weird when I do that, so I'm going to clear off my screen there. Right. Let me go ahead and make it one more time a little bit larger. Right. I just do that so you guys are able to read it a little bit better. Okay. Where are um, basically that DVWA is located on our XAMPP servers? Where, those, where that server is located um, is on the opt lamp um, basically directory down there. So we can just run from here. We can say sudo. We need super user rights to turn on the server. Um, so sudo with the super user do. Let's go ahead and type that in. And then we have it as an executable file. So we can just type in the location and it should fire up the server. So let's go with um, start at root. And then we'll go to opt to lamp. And then it should be in here. Um, I would recommend typing in mana and then tab autocomplete here to autocomplete it out. But this is where, and this is why we wanted us to use this, the US cyber range today. Um, this is where we have in our range the, um, the, the sorry, if I can think here, the, the servers and the DVWA files and where we have them located. We do have a lab that walks through how to install this if you, because it, the Virginia cyber range doesn't have DVWA and or um, XAMPP pre-installed on um, the dual environment, uh, at least not that we've seen. Um, so we have a, a lab, it should be DVWA setup right here. So aligned with 1.2.11, kind of walks through how to set up just like we have it here. If you choose to use it that way, great. If you choose to use it a different way, hey, we don't, we don't, we don't care. Um, as long as you hopefully get something useful from us is what we're here for. So um, I'm going to go ahead and run this. So sudo uh, root op lamp, and then I type in MANA and then auto complete that. Um, so let me hit enter there. And after we do that, it should bring up the XAMPP servers. Okay. Like I said, we have the DVWA files sitting on these servers already set up. Um, and so all we have to do once we type in that command is go to manage servers, the middle tab here, manage servers, and then click restart all or start all and just start those three servers up. Okay. Let me see if I can load up chat here. Might be able to post command, sorry. Getting lost with everything I have open right now. Where's my? I can type them in for you, Joe. Okay. Well, here's this. So you got it, Tom? Okay. We yeah. shouldn't have too many commands here, but I guess any longer command, Tommy will post in the chat in case you want to paste it. We will paste in the get request too, in case people are having trouble finding it. Okay. Once that's done, you should see that all three of these are running. Um, to be honest with you, it doesn't matter if we exit out of this. Um, if we minimize it, whatever you want to do, um, that um, they're going to keep running, whether this application is open or not, the XAMPP, um, app, or basically the server file things here. Um, it doesn't matter if it's open or not. So I'm going to exit out of it. They should be all up and running. Okay, So I'm going to exit out. Uh, yes, I want to quit. It should still be going. It brings me back to my terminal. Um, last thing that we need is... Um, so the server is running. Um, to access this website, we don't have a domain name, so we just have to go to the Kali IP address from the Windows end to be able to access this. Um, so I'm just going to simply do a host name and then a flag I, uh, capital I right there. This I know we could do like an IF config. Um, this to me, we run this in workshops. It's the what we found to be one of the most simple ways to get um, an IP address from the range. So if I do a host name flag capital I, make sure that's a capital I. Um, that's going to put in here the, um, or it's going to show my IP address right there. So it looks like I'm going with a 10.1.52.24. Um, everybody should know that there's going to be different there. Please know what your IP address is. Um, you're going to need that to access these, um, the DVWA application. Okay, so make sure you get that. If you're used to the Virginia Cyber Range, you know that it is different for every computer. Typically, they start with 10.1, and then it's going to be two other numbers after. But anytime we reset these images or start a new image, um, it does assign you a different IP address. Okay. So mine is 10.1.52.24. So what I can do with that now is now we can actually start the lab of the real world. The server's up and running. Um, let's go play the role of the victim and let's um, go to a web page. This web application would be like us going to Facebook or Twitter or um, log into my bank account or um, heck the Whova app right here. Um, let's go ahead and go to Windows and let's open up a browser. Okay, so I'm going to open up Google Chrome here. So I open up Google Chrome. All right. I'll wait for everybody to get there. So we're in Windows now. Um, we're in Windows. 
Um, we're playing the role of the victim. Let's go to our Cali IP address. So mine was 10.1 point, I've already forgot it. 5224, 10.1.52.24. And I'm gonna put a forward slash and then DBWA all lowercase is where this web application is located. Okay. So your Cali IP address um, forward slash DBWA is gonna load up um, that web application right here. Okay, notice there is a login page, which makes sense. Normally when we come up to a web application, the first thing it does is ask us to actually log in so we can use it. Username and password, for those of you who have never um, dealt with DBWA before, the default username and password is admin, and then the password is just password all lowercase. Admin and then password all lowercase, and we all should be able to log in right here, okay? Um, please don't hesitate to tell me to slow down, post anything in the chat. You guys are being a kind of quiet group right now. I hope everything's going okay. Um, Please don't hesitate to interrupt and ask for questions. All right. So um, once I type in admin, all lowercase, and then password, all lowercase, and I log in, all right? Very simple. We're in a web application. Like we said, this can be like Twitter. You log into your Twitter account. Um, you kind of have op options of what to do from here. Uh, what we're going to do first is we're just going to lower the security. Um, so we're going to kind of take away some of the security features um, that have been implemented and kind of back that off so we're able to show how the how a cross site um, kind of works here. So I'm gonna click on DVWA security down here. I'm gonna click on DVWA security. A little tab here on the left side. Um, it's currently set at impossible. This has all the current um, security features set. If you're ever able to break impossible, please email them so that they're able to help patch them. Hey Joe, I've got a couple of questions coming in. A couple of folks are asking, what's the link that we went to? Again, that's we're using the IP address from our Cali system. And then we've hopped over on our Windows environment and we've put in that Kali IP address. And then at the very end, we slap, put on slash DVWA. And here, then that's out here, Tommy. So, once, yeah. I, so pretend you're in the Windows environment typing in the URL. Um, I found my IP address with a host name flag capital I. So I would type in the URL as 0.52.24. And then a forward slash DVWA, just like that is the address I would go to on the Windows end. Yeah, make sure you're doing that on Windows uh, in a browser. Um, so you could just you know, highlight that IP address, right click to copy it, and then jump over to your Windows environment and then you could paste that in the browser there uh, with that slash DVWA that, at the end there. Copy. Okay. I just wanted to. Knock that out instead of having to answer each one of you guys <laughs> uh, independently there. When I log in, it actually still keeps me logged in. But after we logged in, um, admin and password, or your username and password, um, DVWA security. Um, I go ahead, um, sorry, I clicked on the DVWA security tab, and apparently I haven't set it as low yet. But you should see it's currently set as impossible. It kind of tells you there at the top. Um, let's go ahead and select low from the little drop down menu and click submit. And you should see that security level was changed to low. Simple as that, we're just gonna kind of take um, almost all the security measures off at this point. Notice it does say that it's completely vulnerable and has no security measures, we're just interested in showing. I think this attack actually might work at the hard level. I forget whether it's medium or hard that this one goes to, but we're just gonna set the low today, kind of show. Um, <clears throat> so um, notice they kind of hint towards you of where different things can or what attacks can kind of happen with things. Um, we do have labs for the command injection. We have labs for the SQL injection. Um, we do have a cross-site scripting lab. Um, I think we have one other one. I don't remember which one it is, but um, last one that we have is this um, CSRF that kind of works within here. But it, what's unique is if you actually click on the CSRF tab right here on the left, it actually is asking you to change your admin password. Okay. So let's pretend the, the Kali user here, the malicious user knows at this point that the username is admin and the password is password. It's the default one. Let's actually change the default so that Kali user has no idea what it is. If the Windows user changes that password, um, the Kali user would have no idea. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's set our password. It's currently password. I'm going to change mine to Panda. And I'm going to confirm that as Panda. You can change your password to whatever you would like. Change it to whatever you would like. I'm just going to and kind of give out the recommendation that don't forget what your password is, okay? Don't forget it. Um, we can kind of get lost with that. We can show you how to reset it real quick. Okay. 
Okay, so I said panda panda. I'm going to click change here. And notice it says that my password has been changed. Okay. My password has been changed. So um, we've done this how many times in our life where for our email, for different, just anything that we've changed our password. This is nothing new to you. Um, what I want to prove to you here is if we go to log out, we should be able to log back in and we're going to see that password doesn't work. Okay, password doesn't work. So I'm going to click log out. I'm going to type in admin and then I'm going to type my password as password. Try and log in, log in, fail. Nothing crazy with this. Um, we've all seen this a million times. Once you change your password, your old password doesn't work. All right. But what I would like you to do is go ahead and log in with your new password just to prove that it changed. So mine's admin. Um, I changed my personal password that I did here to panda, all lowercase. Um, whatever you changed it to, go ahead and type that in. Let's click log in. And that's just to prove that the password actually changed. And the old password doesn't work, new password does. We've done this probably hundreds, if not thousands of times within our life on the internet where we've changed our passwords. Okay. Any questions so far? Shouldn't be anything mind blowing yet. All we've done is change the password. What we're gonna do now is we're going to do that, basically what we did right there, we changed the password. We're gonna do that again, um, but we're gonna capture it from the Kali end. Um, and then we're going to create a website that automatically does it without this Windows user doing anything. That website's going to do it in the background without them knowing, and it's going to change their password. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip over to the Kali, and we're going to kind of become that malicious user again. So let's go back to the Kali side. I'm going to backspace out this web uh, URL that I kind of typed in. Let's go back here. Um, what I want to show to you is that if we're playing the role of the malicious user, um, we're going to try and access the DVWA application and we're going to notice that we can't access it because we don't know what the password's been changed to. Okay, we're going to try and guess. It's going to be the default settings of admin and password, but we're going to notice we can't access it. So what I want everybody to do is go ahead and open up a web browser. It's the little compass guy down here, little web browser down here. Okay. Brings up Firefox. Okay, so I click that little web browser, little compass looking thing down here. Brings up Firefox here. Um, since the, the server is located on um, the, this Kali machine that we're currently on, we don't type this IP address to go there. Um, what we're actually going to type since we're on this machine is we're going to, we could type 192.0.0.1, um, kind of that home address. But what we can do also is just do, localhost slash dbwa right like that okay. so that's going to be the url that we type in here since we're on the Kali machine okay so i'm going to go up here and go ahead and type in localhost slash dbwa that's like saying my ip address right there okay it's kind of looping back to here i'm going to hit enter there notice it brings me to the dbwa login screen Okay. Remember, we're playing the role of the malicious user now. Um, we want to log into that DVWA app or this app web application. Um, we're going to guess that the username is admin, and they left the password as the default password of password. Man, that's password a lot of time. So I'm going to type in password, and notice it tells me login failed. At this point, the malicious user has no idea what the password is. Malicious user has no idea what the password is, all right? The Windows user has changed it. Mine is currently set at Panda. I don't think we've done anything mind blowing. Um, malicious user doesn't know what the password is. We've changed the password on the Windows end. I'm gonna actually minimize Firefox. I'm not gonna exit out, just minimize it um, and go back to my um, terminal here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna load up Wireshark so that we're able to capture the get request, okay? So to open up Wireshark, which is gonna allow us to capture packets, I'm gonna type in sudo Wireshark. You do need um, admin rights to run Wireshark. <coughs> so we do need to put that sudo in there. I'm gonna hit enter there. So sudo Wireshark, let me move this to the side so you can see that command. Oh, it is gonna give you a little um, kind of warning message. It's just basically saying you're running it as a super user and not as the normal user. You can just click okay to exit out of that. Okay. Nothing loaded wrong, it's just warning you that you're running as a super user. Click OK. So how Wireshark's going to work right here? Um, if you've never used it before, <clears throat> um, you kind of have a whole lot of options of what you can monitor. Well, since we're on the cyber range, there's only one network kind of activity here. I mean, you do have the loopback, but 
for the most part, there's only one, and it's the Ethernet here. It should all be ETH0 for all of us, but let's go ahead and click any. We're just going to monitor everything. Okay? We're just going to monitor everything. So when I click any here, um, what happens is if I click this blue fin right here, if I click the blue fin, it's going to start capturing packets. Okay, now we can go ahead and do that together. So we have Wireshark open, make sure you have it open. I'm gonna click on the blue fin. And notice that it starts capturing all these packets here. We're gonna talk about what these are. Um, I'm actually gonna stop it. So to stop a Wireshark capture, you're gonna click this red square here, okay? And we have a ton of packets. Um, what most, if not all of these packets are, because notice we're not accessing the, the web right now, really. We're not doing anything. Um, what these are, for the most part, is this is our remote desktop talking back and forth with my machine here at home, okay? So these are all the remote desktop um, kind of sending. It's one of the downfalls of using Wireshark in the um, range. There are ways to kind of uh, basically block out, show all packets, but the ones, I'm sorry, show all, yeah, show all packets, but the ones being hosted with uh, basically the remote desktop, kind of the handler. There's ways to block all these off, but we're not really that worried about today, but that's kind of what we're capturing at this point is the remote desktop talking back and forth. Okay. Make sure you have it stopped. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna click on this blue fin to start it here in a second, because I'm gonna do this kind of quick. I'm gonna click on the blue fin. <clears throat> I'm gonna go back to my Windows end and I'm going to change the password again. You know what? I'll get that set up. So I'm going to click on CSRF again on my Windows end. I'm going to click on CSRF and I'm going to change the password again. Um, in the real world, so like if we're using Facebook or something like that, um, all the get requests are the same or very close. Like it, they use it the same for the web application. So you wouldn't 100% need to do this thing. We just kind of show that you can kind of capture these live. Okay. Um, that's why you also need to encrypt this traffic that's going across, but um, we're going to, so basically we're going to click on the blue fin in the Cali end. Um, it's going to ask you, do you want to save the last pack capture? We're going to say no. Um, it's going to start capturing packets. I'm going to go over to my windows end. I'm going to change the password again in DVWA. Um, as the windows user, we're going to change the password and I'm going to go back to my Cali end then, and I'm going to click the red square to stop capturing. In when that happened, we should have captured that pa password change. Um, inside this wire shop. Okay, so let me do that again. I'm going to click the blue fin. Um, do I want to continue without saving? Yes, I don't care to save the old packets. So I'm going to continue without saving. It's starting to capture packets. I'm going to go back to my Windows end. Um, it was set up Panda. I'm going to change it to Penguin. Penguin. I'm going to click change here. It should have just changed my password. It's verifying that my password has been changed from Panda to Penguin. I'm gonna go back to my Cali end and stop right there, okay? Hopefully everybody was able to follow along with that. Okay, I clicked the blue fin. I continued without saving. I went to my Windows end. I changed the password, click submit. Um, it confirmed that the password was changed. So now my password is no longer Panda, it's Penguin. I went back to my Cali end and I clicked stop the red square to stop the packet. So somewhere in there, we should have changed our password and we have to go find that packet. Like we said, this would be really easy to find if we weren't doing the remote desktop because it makes us find thousands of packets. Um, but what we can do, there's a bunch of ways to sort through this, but let's click on the protocol, um, protocol column there. If you click on it, it sorts by the, basically the, the protocol names, okay? If you click on protocol and scroll all the way up to the top, you should find HTTP. One thing that we're also able to do is we could just search by HTTP. Brittany, how long does it? Oh, uh, so um, it does take about 20 minutes. Oh, I see two new people. Um, for this activity, I would just watch. It should be started. Your ranges should be fired up by the time um, Tommy's working on the rainbow tables. You'll be able to do that activity with them. And this is being recorded, so you'll be able to go back and rewatch this if you'd like to do this activity again. Sorry that I, I'm not sure who the other person is. I could refresh the page. Sorry for those that are still warm and got here a little late. It does take about 20 minutes to fire these up the first time. <clears throat> so what I'm actually gonna do, you could sort by protocol, but what I also wanna show you guys is that we can click on the filter up top and I'm gonna search for HTTP. HTTP, I'm gonna click enter. And notice that also just shows me the ones that use the protocol HTTP. What we're looking for 
is this packet right here, the top one is my get request. You can see it says get, and then it's kind of showing me what's happening there. That's what we're looking for, actually. We don't have to load up the whole packet. We can kind of see it right there. But what I like us to do is let's go ahead and uh, find that one. I searched for HTTP up here. Find that packet that says get, and it starts with a root DBWAIA all the way down. I want you to right click on it. So I right click on it. I know this can be a little tough in a Chromebook. You know, kind of use the two finger. But I right click on that packet. I click follow and then HTTP stream. I'll leave it right there for a second. So I find that packet that says get and it'll start with DVWA and some other stuff. We can expand it out and see the whole thing. But I right click on it. I go to follow Oops. and then HTTP stream. That brings up this lovely guy, and this is what we want, all right? Notice there's a whole lot of things here. First, <laughs> kind of important here, is we just captured the session ID, and we have a great session hijacking lab, is that at this moment in time that we just captured that session ID, we can log in and go to that same session as this user is using right now. So what that means is if you're logged into your bank account, Tommy hijacks my session, um, all of a sudden he's looking at, everything that I'm able to have access to. It's like he's logged in as me. That one's a dangerous one. So we have that as a session hijacking lab, just using this session ID that's captured. All you gotta do is simply change your cookies. It's one of the most simple labs um, as far as tools go. You just change your cookies. All you do to this, your session ID to this, and it logs you right in. Hey Joe, um, you, know a, you know an easier way that I can view everything you're doing? Have you stream it via exactly. Zoom? If I get on Zoom with you, then I can see everything. Here. <laughs> Just show everybody the world, my, my data here. <laughs> and then we record it and post it out there, right? Is that what happens? <laughs> Super secure. <laughs> um, so there's session ID. That's a great thing to kind of steal there. But one thing that I like to show is we actually know what their new password is right now. Um, we're going to pretend that we don't know. But notice it shows. I know it's really small um, on your screen. You might not be able to read it, depending on how big the screen you're using is. But it shows that... Um, it shows the get request here. It says password new is penguin, uh, password confirmed is penguin, change, change. Um, you should see that on your end, what your new password is set to, but this is the get request that we want, okay? And I'm actually gonna copy and paste it in the chat. Now this get request is trying to change the password to penguin, okay? But if you weren't able to find it in chat now, that's the get request we're gonna use. It's gonna be the same for all of our DBWA applications. This is where it turns dangerous because um, for like a Facebook, the get request is going to be the same for that for everybody to change their Facebook password. And so what the Kali user could have done here, instead of having to use Wireshark to capture all of this, they could have just opened up their own DBWA account, um, captured their own request of changing request. Once you know how the get request works, you can make the, you can make the um, website. And so we're going to use this. We know this info now. We kind of have a long roundabout way to get it, but we captured the get request. We're gonna use this to make that, um, basically that website that's gonna forge this request. Okay. We're gonna get that for a website that forges the request. So let's start making that website that'll forge the request. Um, what I want us to do is let's go ahead and open a new terminal. Open a new terminal here. I got a lot going on on my screen. For the most part, what um, I'm worried about you guys having open, so I'm gonna make this a little larger so you're able to see it. Um, what I'm worried about you guys having open is um, two things, a new terminal, and then this little uh, HTTP stream that has that get request. Okay, and if you need the get request, I posted it in chat. All right, so when you open up your new terminal, um, what I want you to do is we're going to navigate to the desktop um, with a simple change directory. I hope we've all seen this before. If not, that's fine. We have the Linux one on one lab, I would highly recommend you run through if you are a complete novice at Linux. Um, we're gonna change directory to the desktop. Make sure you put a capital D in there for the desktop. So change directory desktop. Um, after you type that in, you should see that we're now working off the desktop directory. Right there. Okay, we're on the desktop. The reason I do that is I just like you to see when we create the this little web page real quick. Um, I just want you to see it appear on the desktop, okay, that we're not lying to you. So I changed directory to my desktop. Um, a simple touch command will create that uh, website. Um, I always joke around here. Um, if you want somebody to try and open up a website, um, you kind of, this is this whole social engineering thing of what do you want to call it? What do you want to do? Well, we're playing the role of the victim and the user here that 
you're not really going to be able to hide it from yourself very well. There's no need to. Um, but in the real world, this would be a big step of how do we hide it and get them to open this web page. Well, I joke that if I would if I were to name the website Texas.html, Tommy's opening that every time I send it to him. He can't deny any anything that has Texas in the name. So every stinking time I fall for this thing. So I'm going to say touch texas.html. You can name this whatever you would like. If you'd like to name it virginia.html. Um, I believe in the lab we title it passwordchange.html. Um, we even get a little not sneaky at all and tell you what it's doing um, in the website name. But I'm going to name it texas.html. Although, There's Joe, I will, as a point of trivia, let everybody know that uh, Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston, two of the founding fathers of Texas, are both native Virginians. There you go. I did not know that. So when I run the texas.html, notice that this texas.html kind of web page files right there um, is created on the desktop. If we were to click on it, it's going to be a blank file, okay? But we just created that file on our desktop. Okay, like we said, um, kind of a simple Linux command. Touch is one of the harder ones to explain why it is what it is. But for the sake of today and right now, um, Touch just creates that little text file and it puts it on the desktop because it puts it on the desktop because we are in the desktop directory. Um, what I want from us now is we are going to make this web page, okay? Um, and if you recall what I said, we're going to use um, what tool we're going to use to make it. There's a bunch of tools that we could type in. Personally, I like the nano editor. Tommy uses the VI editor. Um, but for the sake of workshops, we do LeafPad. So if you just type in LeafPad Texas or whatever you name that document, all right? So I have LeafPad Texas.html. It brings up that document in a little leaf. I like to say this looks a lot like WordPad. Okay. Um, that's why we kind of use it in workshops. And I believe if I do, you don't need to worry about this is me so that you're able to read what I'm typing a little better. So I'm going to make my font about 24 if it allows me. Okay. Here we go. You're going to be able to see my font a little bit better. Whoops. Clicking all over the place, Joe. Come on. There, there it is. All right. So let me see if I can extend this over. There we go. All right, so when we create the web page, it's going to be a super simple web page. We're going to put a header so that something actually appears when we load the web page. Um, the header is just kind of, I don't know if you want to call it red herring. I don't know if red herring is the right term. The header or whatever you do for the web page, it doesn't really matter. The web page just something loads up. In the background is what we're worried about. But let's make that header real quick so we can say, um, start a simple header. I can say, welcome to this website. Ah, if I can type today. That is called Texas. There we go. Just a, a stupid simple web or header right here. You can put whatever you want there. Um, I believe in the lab we just say something like "Welcome to this web page" or something like that. Um, just just so something called the did boy. Can't type today. Um, it's just so something appears on the website. Um, like I said, some people would create little games within their website that, so that when someone goes there, they're thinking, oh, it's a little game I can play. Or you can just like host images, oh, it's images. Like there's all sorts of things that we could do here to make it look like, hey, this website is supposed to be a legit website. But in the background, we're gonna go down and we're gonna, this is what actually matters. In the background, we're gonna run this get request. It's gonna be done, the one we're gonna create today is gonna be done in the form of an image, okay? Um, when an image is uploaded, we can have it upload from a source. Um, when it comes in from that source, basically it goes to that website and it brings the image in. Um, nothing that crazy. So if I put the source as, I don't know, um, cyber.org slash probably cyber logo, it might bring in our logo from our website um, to this web page. But what we're going to do is we're not going to display that image. Okay, so it's never going to appear. We're going to say display none. And then the last thing that we're going to do is the source where it goes and gets this image from, the source that it gets the image from is actually the get request, okay? And so when it tries to go get the image, what actually happens is it's just running the get request, okay? And we're gonna forge it. So what's gonna happen here is we're gonna bring up an image. So put a little uh, less than sign, we'll say image there. Um, style is where we're gonna say, we don't want this image to display. So we're gonna put display and then none. So let me stop there, okay? So we started, to bring up an image, but display, we don't care to display it because no image would actually display since the source that we're gonna find this from, excuse me, is a uh, um, get request, okay? No image is actually gonna load. Okay, so we're not gonna display because we don't care to. And then I'm gonna have us type in two different things, the source and the alternate source. 
um, but we're not gonna put those in at this point. So we can say source equals, and just put two quotations next to each other. That's where the source would go in between those. And then an alternative, alternative, alt equals, and do the same thing and end that. This is our whole image request, okay? Um, so we're trying to load an image. We're not gonna display that image. Um, we have a source to draw the image from, an alternate one to draw it from. Um, but remember, the source is not going to be an actual image. It's going to be this forgery of a get request. We're going to say, hey, as the source, actually run this get request. Actually do this. Um, but don't display the image because there's obviously no image there. Okay. And now, and this is where the we're going to paste the get request in. What you need to do is go to your Wireshark here, this little follow HTTP stream. Remember, I pasted it in chat if you need it. And you're going to copy everything from the forward slash dbwa the start of that all the way down to the second change it's going to say change equals change copy all of that that's the get request copy it and then we're going to paste it between the two quotations of source so we're going to copy everything from forward slash dbwa all the way to the change equals change the second change there we're going to copy that and we're going to paste it in between the two quotation marks of source this is the get request so when I paste it, it makes that really long, okay? You can kind of scroll through. What I'm gonna do for the sake of um, you guys being able to read my screen is I'm gonna word wrap it and so that it kind of wraps around right there. Okay, that should all be on one line. I just word wrap it so I can see it all right here. So the next thing that I want us to do is instead of changing the password of penguin or whatever word you have in here, I'm gonna change this penguin to something else and then I gotta confirm it over here. Tell me, you got a password that you would like me to use? Do you want me to use Austin since you just were talking about Stephen F. Austin? Sure. Go for it. Yeah. I'll type in my password new as Austin, and I'm going to confirm it here as Austin. Okay. So here's our forgery request that we're going to change this. Instead of it being Penguin, we're going to try and change this person's password. I'm personally using Austin. You can change it whatever you would like. So we're going to attempt to change this person, the Windows user, without them knowing. I am going to attempt to change their password to Austin. Okay. So let's re-verify everything, kind of double check your website here. I have a simple header. It starts with the kind of header flag here, ends right here. And it's just, we can have it say whatever. Welcome to this website that is called text. You can have it say whatever you would like. You actually don't even need that header either. We just do it so something appears. Uh, we're going to try and load an image up. We're not going to display that image. We're not going to display it, so display none. We're not going to display it. We have a source and alternate, um, but that source is actually a get request. That get request right there is going to attempt to change the password in DBWA to Austin. Okay? We type it in as the new password, make sure it's confirmed, and then we want to change it. Change equals change. Okay. Let's go ahead and save this. So file save. Nothing crazy there. Um, when you do save it, the, your little file there changes to a little globe to show that it's now an actual website file or HTML file. Okay. Once you save it, you can go ahead and exit out of this. Okay, our website's built. Okay, your website's built. If you double click on this, I believe in the, oh look, it actually opens it up um, in um, Firefox, which makes sense. I meant to open it up as a word editor, but that's okay. Okay, so we have this file sitting here. Um, go back to your, um, your uh, terminal that has the desktop currently um, open right here. And what we're going to do is we just have to move this um, website file to our servers. We could like email this web page out to the person. Um, we could do a whole lot of ways to get it to them. We're just simply going to load it to our server since we already have it running. Okay. You can create your own link somewhere on a web page, however you want to get them to open the web page. All they have to do is open it. But I'm just going to say sudo. We need super user rights since um, we are loading to wire. I'm sorry, we're loading to the XAMPP servers. So we're going to say sudo move mv. So super user move this. Move the texas.html file, whatever you called your um, web page there. So move that file to. And the location of the XAMPP servers are op lamp. Remember, those were the two that we used to open it. But the, the files are actually located at htdocs. I'll stop there. So we're going to say sudo move texas.html, that web, um, web file right here, this little simple web page. And then the location of our servers is root op lamp ht docs. 
Okay, so root op lamp ht docs. Make sure lamp has two p's there. Um, ht docs, ht docs. If you want to tab out of it, make sure those are spelled correctly, or else we might move it into one of these files and rename it to something different, which is always fun to try and fix those errors. So we're going to move this Texas file there. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. You should see it disappear, and it has now been moved to our XAM servers. It's on the files. We can load that web page. Okay. So the web page that we are going to go to from the Windows end, I'm just going to type this in here. No need for you to type this in. This is just me showing. I kind of like this new little thing that I've started of typing in the website. Um, so the web page that I'm going to go to, and I'm going to move this to the side and this one to the side. So I can get my Cali IP address right there. Whoops, there we go. So my Cali IP address is 152.24. So the web page that I'm going to go to would be 10.1.52.24, my Cali IP address. And then it's going to be forward slash. And then the name of that file, my file is called texas.html. So the web page that I'm going to go to on the Windows end is going to be my Cali IP address forward slash texas.html. That's going to be done from the Windows end. We're done as the malicious user for this for the time being. So let's go ahead and do that. Go to the Windows end. Um, what we're going to need to do here, there is one catch, and this is one of the ways to kind of uh, mitigate this attack or stop it, um, is we have to be logged into the application for this to work. It's using our current session to do it. Um, so this is one of the dangers of leaving tabs open. It's one of the reasons a bank account is going to log you out after five minutes of inactivity, because you don't want to leave your accounts logged in, because you're at risk for attacks like this. Okay. So we have to leave this tab open. Leave yourself logged in. I don't care where you are inside of there. Just have yourself logged in. Open a new tab. So I'm going to click a new tab up here. Okay. Notice my DBWA is still logged in, and I have a new tab open. Okay. I'm going to go to that web address that I said. So it's 10.1.52.24. And then mine is called texas.html. If you chose to follow along with me, it's forward slash texas.html, whatever that file is called. Okay. And here's the mistake the Windows user makes. They go to this web page. The other mis I mean, I guess they make a couple mistakes here. They go to this web page while DBWA is still logged in. So let's go ahead and do it. Make the mistake. I hit enter here. Notice that I have my banner. Welcome to this website that is called Texas. Well, that's weird that you'd call a website Texas, but okay. I went here. As the Windows user, we're like, this is a dumb website. Why did Tommy send me to this website that just loads up a simple header? Well, I don't know at this point that in the background, we can look up the files and stuff, but in the background, it's trying to load an image that is actually a GET request that's trying to change my password. Okay. I have to play the role of the Windows user here. I think that my DVWA password at this point is Penguin. That's the last one I changed it to. You got to remember what was the last one that your Windows user changed it to. Okay. What I want you to do now is I want you to log out of DVWA and try and log back in with the password that that Windows user thinks. So I'm gonna go down here and click, DB, or I'm sorry, not DBW, I'm gonna click log out. I think my username is admin, and I think my password is penguin. Admin and penguin. I'm gonna click log in, and notice that it tells me login failed. Without me knowing as the Windows user, this web page has now changed my password. Anybody else get those to work where it changed your password and it's not working? Because we're gonna go log in from the um, Cali end, we're going to log in as that, but anybody, everybody, anybody able to see it? We're being kind of quiet. We're going to continue to be quiet. No one's actually working. <laughs> totally ignoring you. No. Um, so we tried to log in just to kind of recap here. We, we tried to log in and we were using our old password before. So you had penguin, right? And yep, so it didn't work as expected. We we haven't told it to change password, but that's because this malicious attack has changed the password. So that's kind of where we're at right now. We, you're trying to log in with the admin and then maybe tried password, or you maybe tried penguin. That's what Joe had earlier. But the, you know, the user might be going, hey, why isn't my password working? I haven't tried anything. But between the time it was changed and now, then, um, you know, then we've got this new one going through uh, the new password. I think in your case, Joe had said it to to Austin. 
Austin, yeah. So let's go play the role of that actually malicious user here. Um, I'm going to go back to my Kali machine. Um, on my Kali machine, I'm going to find the Firefox web page here. And so the malicious user at this point knows that they have changed the password they have attempted to try and get the user to change their password to Austin. And so I'm going to now type in admin and then Austin to try and log in. And notice it logs me right in. The password had been changed to Austin. Okay. Unless Tommy, or have you said this, or you said it in password? I don't know. Where this becomes really dangerous is what if we're not just trying to change a password? What if like we don't ever care to log in as that user? What if we just send a get request that I'm hoping that if I send it to Tommy, he's logged into his bank account and I'm saying send $5,000 to my bank account from his without him knowing. So he opens up this new password and all of a sudden, boom, the money's sent without him knowing to another thing. The get request was trying to send money. That's where this stuff turns dangerous on things like that. What if you start stealing people's personal files, um, things like that? That's where this attack turns dangerous. So, um, also, Joe, on that, on that point, um, I like to remind our teachers that whenever you're talking about these kind of attacks, um, remember that some of these students don't really have necessarily, uh, they may not have their own bank accounts, or if they do, they don't have much money in there. So it's not a you know, it's not going to drain their life savings or whatever. So a lot of students um, don't really connect with the monetary threat of this. Um, I was talking to my sister-in-law about this issue with, um, with my niece and um, the, you know, the thing to, to remember whenever, uh, you know, some of these high school students that don't have bank accounts, don't have money is that you have to uh, reflect on things that they do have and they have social clout, you know, social media, access logins someone could use sort, some sort of an attack against their social media account or if they're a gamer they may have some kind of uh, stored or perceived stored value on their gaming account and so um, you know someone could could steal their password their uh, login or something like that so um, these sorts of attacks are not just monetary um, this login attack could be anything that um, that they have a login access to so that's where um, we have to always connect with the students, put it in context that, that they're um, aware of. Now, obviously, uh, in the working world, monetary value carries much more value than just uh, um, than any kind of gaming value. But just recently, what was it last week, Joe, that uh, Twitter, um, some, some high profile Twitter accounts were compromised and then used to, to lure, um, lure folks to, to send Bitcoin. So, yeah. Any questions? Um, I think, uh, sorry, I kind of, Tommy, throwing a curveball here. Maybe um, take, we can take a little break right now before we start the rain. You bet. Yeah, that's a great uh, idea. Yeah. Any, uh, any questions or anything before we move on? You guys are kind of been a little bit of a quiet group here, which is okay. Um. Eileen's uh, asking that, that Twitter, was it uh, HTTP hack or Swift? Uh, actually, it was, uh, it's starting to, uh, details are starting to emerge that it was an insider attack, that uh, some kind of a social engineering attack carried out. Um, details are continuing to emerge on that, but insider threats are always really dangerous. Um, you, you never know what, what people's intentions are going to be and, and what's, you know, are they acting out of, personal greed or they blackmailed, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure that's going to be an interesting case as it unfolds. Um, some of the Bitcoin exchanges have, uh, were able to head off um, people sending uh, money to the attackers. Um, so they weren't able to get all the money that way. John York uh, says, uh, this demo works because we're able to change the web page on the site itself. How would we get this to work when we can't create the text.html on the target website. So the, um, the web page that gets loaded, um, the source that Joe walked us through, and if you look at your source file, um, the source on that image, uh, the URL is slash DVWA, et cetera, et cetera. So if we were to load a web page somewhere else, a different website, and it was to load a resource from the target website, say we're attacking you know, Twitter or Facebook, then that URL would be on the other website, would say load this resource from Facebook or Twitter. So it carries out that, that attack, it grabs those credentials and hands it off to the web page. They got loaded on uh, 
you know, totally not a sketchy domain dash Twitter dot not a sketchy website dot are you <laughs> or something like that. You know, it's, it's going to make it uh, kind of some sort of a, like a phishing attack or a, a watering hole attack where you've got a very similar URL. Um, the URL appears to be somewhat legitimate. Um, and then you've got that web page hosted over there and it's going to reference um, the, the target website that we're after. In this case, 10.1. Blah, blah. Um, the other thing is that it's, re it's relying on a lazy web programming. Um, so we carried out this attack. Um, it, this attack relied on the user using the get protocol um, to, you know, and, and embedding the password up there in the URL. So where you, where you saw the ampersand, you know, password equals penguin or password equals Austin or, you know, whatever the password is. If it's got a URL, uh, if the password is better than that URL, then that URL can then be manipulated by someone else out there on the interwebs. So it's, it's, it's kind of a two-fold attack. Um, lazy web programming is, is the weakness here. And then um, some other website would be uh, hosting a web page that looks very believable to be our target, but it's pulling those resources from here. So, um, Joe, let's uh, let's just take a, a ten minute break. Um, we'll come back. A case study or no homework on our ten minute break? <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just we'll, we'll let it have a break. Go top sure. off the coffee or whatever. Um, we'll come back at the top of the hour. Yeah. So. Okay. Like we're back at the top of the hour. I think everybody's east coast up for you, Tommy. So that'll be right at eleven. So. Yep. Um, so, Brittany, uh, um, we can, for the sake of today, it doesn't really matter. You can just kind of exit out of everything. And I believe, Tommy, you're not going to need the Windows environment for the rainbow attack. Correct. Rainbow. No, we'll just need uh, just the Linux environment. So um, you can close out everything, and we'll just open up a new terminal when we come back. Cool. We'll see everybody at the top of the hour. Um, don't hesitate to exit out of everything. Just have your um, Cali turn or um, desktop just open and ready to go. So. Cool.
There we go. Up and running. <laughs> it's uh it's nap time for my uh Hello, TJ. for my little my little neighbor here. So okay, get the right window going here on my end. I always get too many windows open on here. Shouldn't leave those tabs open, Tommy. Too many tabs. That's what it is. I was getting tricked with that Texas.html page. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Does everybody get their coffee topped off? Pit stops? We got this quiet group, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> I did like Angela's comment. Thank you, Angela. Okay. Um, I see. And Joe, I just sent you that. Um, all right. Um, let's see. I got a question here. Um, going to cyber.org, uh, someone says they're able to log in um, and all the courses, it gives you a message uh, that you're not able to see the content. Um, um, I, I tell you, if you're having that problem, can you email Tommy and I, and then we can get you in touch with the people who run the, the, um, the range. There's Tommy's email. We'll forward and make, get you in touch with the two ladies that run the, the range, or not the range, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the canvas. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, how's that looking, Joe? Is that? Yeah, it looks good. All right, so um, we've got um, on on all of the lessons that we've that we're on here. Uh, the next one we're going to be looking at is uh, down here on one two twenty eight cryptographic attacks, which are, are is largely um, different kinds of password attacks, and we're looking at rainbow tables. So we're going to be looking at rainbow tables. I'm going to click on that to open it up. And uh, this rainbow table um, attack uses rainbow crack. This is something that comes uh, pre-bundled with Kali Linux. So any Kali environment that you're in on the cyber range will uh, support this one. And then uh, we're getting after uh, this objective that comes on the security plus exam is just kind of understanding what are rainbow tables. So first of all, we need to talk about what is a hash. Uh, a hash is a uh, one-way um, algorithm that converts any variable size input uh, into a fixed size output or what's known as a digest. So it's a, a one-way algorithm. We can take some big long value or a little bitty tiny value or data files, uh, source code of any kind of program, you name it, um, and uh, takes all of that, that content and boils it down to a string of characters. And those string of characters are always the same fixed size. So um, on this one, uh, this example here, we've got the Adler 32 hashing algorithm. Uh, I encourage you to check that one out, Adler 32, if you're talking with your students about hashes, because it is a short, brief hashing algorithm. It is not at all secure. <laughs> you can get uh, what's called collisions. And a collision is anytime you have two inputs that result in the same output. Um, not something that you want to have happen in a hash. You want to have um, one and only one output or digest for every um, uh, conceptual form of input on there. So um, by that, you're, you're going to need a longer digest, the, the more possibilities of data you throw at it. Um, right now, the, the kind of go-to acceptable uh, form of hashing is the secure hashing algorithm, SHA. 512. Um, so anyways, we have a whole lesson on, on hashes, but what we're after is we want to try and crack one of these hashes. We want to uh, break them apart. And the, uh, an efficient way to do that computationally is with the rainbow table. So what a rainbow table is, uh, you take, um, it, it's a, a, a pre-computed list of hash values. Um, so we have to think about um, how um, hashes are computed. Um, when you break apart, when you look into the, the hashes lesson, a hash is um, 
it, it takes a, a string of values and it does some computation on it. And it revisits that and usually revisits it and revisits it and revisits it. It's computationally intensive to generate one hash. Um, it's not overly intensive to do that, but you can imagine if I need to do this for all possible values of all, uh, of all the passwords on a system, uh, that can be very resource, resource intensive. So what we can do is if we know the hashing algorithm that's used, we can quickly compute a bunch of um, uh, feelers to try and really hone in on uh, portions of, uh, of what the, the input is um, for, that, for a specific digest. So um, here we've got uh, some inputs. And so we're gonna be looking at uh, doing an MD5. It's the message digest five uh, checksum or hash uh, or algorithm. And um, we're gonna be, the MD5 uh, checksum is one that's used quite often um, online to determine if a file um, has been tampered with online or not. You'll usually see like a download link and then you'll see an MD5 uh, link over the side that has the digest on there. Uh, Brittany asks, is there somewhere uh, you have these shared presentations or the course material that you're selected from? Yeah, it's all coming off the Canvas page uh, that we shared at the top of the, uh, the course there. Uh, Cyber.org, you can access it there. That gives you access to Canvas and to the page here. Um, and if you, when you get access to it, you scroll down to one, two, 28, cryptographic attacks, and we are in rainbow tables. Um, so just kind of a, a, exploring what is a rainbow table. Um, you have to know what the hashing algorithm is. And uh, one thing to know about uh, rainbow tables is that they are built for each application or operating system. There's no one table for all uses. Whenever you're using a dictionary attack on passwords, you are um, using a predefined list of, uh, of words for that dictionary attack. You can download these uh, dictionaries and use them. Not so with rainbow tables. You might be able to download one for, uh, you know, MySQL server version 1.2 point, you know, you would download it for a specific model, but that could change and each system could change. Um, even the passwords on our uh, CyberRange accounts are, um, pass, uh, are hashed and salted uniquely for each individual user. So why do they call them a rainbow table? So what a rainbow table does is it takes the first number of characters of a hash and then hashes those values. And then it takes that result and hashes those. And it takes those and it hashes them again and again and again and again. And it creates what's called a, a chain. And each step of that chain is, um, has just been referred to by a color. Okay, so your first one's gonna be red and then your next one's gonna be the orange um, uh, hash, and then you've got the yellow hash, and the green, and the blue, and you end up with kind of a Roy G. Biv. If, he, if each iteration of that hash is named after a color, eventually you're going to have a big long chain of all these different colors, right? And so you're going to end up with what would conceptually be a rainbow of colors, and that's where the name comes from. So uh, a table of all the colors, like a rainbow, and that's where you get the, the word rainbow table. It's not that there's actually anything colored in these files with different colors of the rainbow, but that's where the name is derived from. It's a bit of a stretch, I think, but uh, you know, I don't get to make up these decisions. So, um, so what we're gonna do is you would take this table and you look at the first X characters. Computers are really good at pattern matching, aren't they? So it can, uh, it can look at these two uh, things and say, are these two values equal, yes or no? Um, and I guess that's the extent of what kind of pattern matching they're good at. Are these two things equal or not? And it can say yes or no very, very quickly. So with a rainbow table, you can generate, you know, thousands uh, of uh, iterations of these hashes and it can quickly go through and compare and compare and compare and compare and compare and compare. And um, what it does is if a, fat, if a match is not found, it takes the next ones and it hashes, it takes the next few characters and it hashes those and it looks for a match. And if not, then it looks for a match and it looks for a match and it looks for a match. When a match is finally found, then you, what you do is you can take the, uh, the plain text that generated that chain and you know that plain text is a part of that target password. So what you're doing is you're breaking apart what could be uh, a long digest and you're breaking it up into parts. And so I know, well, there's a piece of it and I can go through and hash find another piece of it. And then it's just a matter of uh, joining those um, those different components that make up the password. So you're narrowing down the list from uh, thousands and millions of possibilities down to um, uh, just down to one. So uh, that's kind of what a rainbow table is. And then um, 
we're now going to jump into actually doing one. So uh, I'm going to slide my PowerPoint over here to the side monitor here. I'm going to use that as my reference point, make sure I'm covering all the steps for you guys. Uh, in the cyber range, we can close out all the stuff that Joe had us doing earlier. Um, you know, just think of it as, you know, new day, um, new class, and um, you know, you've just come in, you're logging into the cyber range. We're on the Kali Linux environment. And um, then uh, open up a terminal here and it will take you, it'll log you in as a student by default. And uh, you're on the Kali system here on the, uh, the home directory for the, um, for a regular student login. Okay, so uh, let's do uh, one thing. Let's, we're gonna log in as root. And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna type in sudo space su. So we're gonna switch user to the uh, super user account. And tell you what, yeah, I'm just gonna run it as that. All right, and when you do that, you will notice a couple things. Whenever you're logged in as the super user or the root admin account, you'll see that your username has changed from student to root. And you've also got the prompt change from dollar sign to the uh, pound sign, the hashtag, whatever we're calling it today, Octothorpe. Um, whatever that emblem is, uh, will tell you that you're logged in as root. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're, uh, if you go in, uh, we're gonna, uh, run the rainbow table generate command, making use of the rainbow table generate command. And first of all, you can take a, 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 a tour of what all is available by running the dash H. There is not a man page. If you're familiar with man pages, there's not a man page for RT gen, but the help command on here will tell you all of what it can do. I'm going to widen my window a little bit here. Um, that's just going to kind of word wrap. No worry around that. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is we are going to uh, use it. We're gonna uh, generate some rainbow tables. We're gonna tell it what hashing algorithm we're gonna use. Today we're using uh, the MD5, um, which character set to generate from, um, what's the minimum length, the maximum length, uh, and then we're gonna give some table index uh, and then the chain length up here. Chain length and then um, all of that. So it's going to look, the command's going to look very similar to what we've got there at the bottom. Key this one in with me. We're going to say uh, rainbow table generate an MD5. And we're going to just focus on uh, lowercase alpha. Alpha, if I can type it. Lowercase alphabet. Um, and that's going to restrict the number, the character set that um, our MD5 hashes will, uh, our possibilities would be. And uh, then we're going to uh, tell it that we want to have um, a minimum length of one, a maximum length of five, and then um, table index, we're going to start at zero. And I want this, these chains, remember the, the chains are, are those colors that make up the rainbow. We're going to make our chains 16,000 uh, long, and then um, uh, tell it uh, 16,000 here on the uh, chain number and zero for the index on those. So when you issue this command, it does take a while. So I'll tell you what, this is a kind of a long one. So I'm going to copy that and I'll paste it over here in chat for us. Here we go. So that's kind of a long one, but when you issue that, it does take a little bit to run. Um, it takes less than a minute. Um, I found uh, as I was playing with this um, on average, it takes less than a minute. But again, this is restricting it to just lowercase alphabet. Of course, if we did a mixed alphabet, upper and lowercase, it's gonna take, it's gonna generate twice as uh, many chains. And then if we were to do something longer than just five characters, um, it would also be longer. So again, this is where longer is better. Um, it, it would take longer for us to generate a rainbow table for this particular attack. But what we do is if we would log into a system, we would generate rainbow tables for our system, for our target system, whatever we're after. And you can see here that it took uh, 31 seconds, about 32 seconds for it to generate these tables. So these are our tables. We're gonna stuff them away for now. We're gonna come back later and you're gonna see how the um, Rainbow Crack tool uses those. But um, if you don't have this installed on your uh, Kali um, environment for some reason, we've got the setup um, on PowerPoint. And Joe's gonna show us also how to go through and set up our um, 
uh, environments so that we can do all this kind of stuff. So you don't have to use just the, the US cyber range one that we've got. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to change director. We're going to go over to user share rainbow crack. Okay, so CD user share rainbow crack. And then we're going to create a file called hashes. And so I'm going to use the, what's that? Uh, sorry, I thought, I thought I heard something. Uh, so we're going to use uh, the touch command and hashes.txt. So the touch command will just touch a file into existence. Um, Basically, we're setting the time and date of a file, uh, popping it into existence there. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna populate this hashes.txt file with some MD5 hashes, some, uh, the output of some MD5 hashes. Um, so the first thing, let me, let me show you how this uh, command's gonna work here. We're gonna say, I wanna echo a name like Tommy. And remember that you've got a maximum character length of five. The rainbow table has been generated for a maximum character length of five. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the output, the word Tommy, and we're going to run that through an, uh, we're going to do an MD5 sum on the name Tommy. When you press enter on that, it will give you the MD5 hash of whatever text we put in here. And if you try to type in just the text on its own, it will complain saying, I don't see a file named Tommy. That's why you have to do this echo, echo the text Tommy, and then pass that output onto this command called MD5. So um, using this command, echo dash in Tommy MD5 sum. There's a couple of ways you can uh, go about working with this. You can output the, the hash here and it will generate the, the hash output. You can right click, copy that and go out to the, um, to the directory user share rainbow crack. In fact, I'll show you how to do that. This is, that's, this is the kind of more manually intensive way. Uh, if you go to, we're gonna go to slash user share. I didn't spell that correctly. Rainbow crack. I didn't spell that one correctly either. user share rainbow crack, and then you'll see that there's this hashes.txt. We'll need to open that with, uh, with leaf pad, but you'll need to do that as root. So um, that's you know one way you can do that one. Um, the way that I like to do this one, and I, and I can put it over in the chat for you because it gets a little cryptic for you. Um, I take this file, this output, and I can pipe it into the hashes.txt. But the catch with this portion here, and we've got this outlined in the, in the PowerPoint for you. The catch with this one is it's going to output all of this, which is the hash and the file name, which in, in this case was there was no file name, so it's gonna give you this little uh, dash that's out here. We don't want that, hat, that dash or that hyphen. So what we need to do is we need to throw that out. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put this in chat for you um, because this one gets a little uh, hairy on here. We're going to use the awk command and I'm going to say uh, print dollar sign one. Now all of this, let me highlight that for you. All of that issuing that command now will output that hash into our hashes.txt. And we can confirm that by running cat hashes and you see that we get just the digest, not the digest and the hyphen on there. So if there was ever uh, a, 
a use for awk if you've never used it before. What it's doing is it's saying print the first column, anything before the first white space, and that's what all of this stuff is. So we're saying echo someone's the the name of a user or some kind of uh, five character long string hand that off to md5 and then print off the first value and hand it off then to uh, put it in the hashes.txt file that's going to create this hash here and then i'm going to use the up arrow to recall that string and i'm going to press my back arrow and i'm going to come over here and i can do any character as long as it's between one character and five characters you got a five character max on here so i'm going to put in joe And we can also put in another one here. We're going to hash Virginia Cyber Range, V-A-C-R, Vacker. And what's another one, Joe? You know, let's do Ohio and Texas. And remember, we're, we're hashing these values. Um, if I uh, hash Virginia, that's going to be too long because remember our rainbow tables are only generated for five characters. So we can't, uh, so Virginia secure, <laughs> I guess we could say. Um, so we've got these different uh, processes that are on here and then we'll do one more. I'll come over here and I'll do, let's hash cyber. Okay. So we've got, uh, we've got some hashes generated. We've got Tommy, Joe, Vacker, Ohio, Texas, cyber. All of these are, uh, are now hashed. And if we view the hashes that are stored, we've got this text file of just some hashes. If we came across this text file, we, we wouldn't know what values are, uh, are used to generate these hashes. These, it's just some encrypted data. Um, if you couldn't see the commands that we had issued up here to create those hashes, we wouldn't know what the output is. So that's where, that's where our target is. We're gonna try and crack these hashes to figure out what was the input that was used to generate these MD5 hashes. So um, what we're gonna do is we are um, going to, uh, first of all, we need to go through and we're gonna make some order of all the, uh, the rainbow tables that, um, that uh, the rainbow table, the rainbow crack tool did. So we're gonna run the um, RT sort and we're gonna tell it, I wanna sort all the rainbow tables that are found in the current directory. Again, this is all laid out in the PowerPoint for you. Um, so it goes through and it says, okay, I only saw one file and that was the one that you generated here just now. Um, it's lowercase alphabet. It ranges from one to five characters and you've got 16,000 by 16,000 chains. It's a huge, huge uh, file. Um, it's actually been crunched down. I think it's only 250 K um, large. 250k small, depending on how you want to view it. Um, so we've got that. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the rainbow crack tool to crack those hashes. So um, the, the way that this is going to look, the, the processes that's involved is if we were to issue this, um, this you know, command again, and we were to say something like cyber, and we're going to MD5 sum the word cyber, it's going to give us this output. So I'm going to copy this output. And again, you can see that that's the same output that we got up here on this, you know, this supposedly mysterious hashes file that we've come across. Hey, Tom, you see uh, Brittany's comment? Sorry. Uh, Brittany says, uh, when you paste the command in, it won't let you edit the names out. Joe Vacker, Ohio. Um, so do you paste it the first time? And if you press the up arrow, can you then go back and do it this way? Just using the arrow keys to go back. So I'm using the up arrows to recall the command because I think when you paste it, it probably automatically issues that. But if you press the up arrow, then you should be able to cycle through a previous command and then left arrow back to go in and change the input there. Did that help? Great. Okay. So, uh, so what we did is we, we created the hash manually for cyber. Now, if we wanted to crack just one password and we had a rainbow table, we could just use the rainbow crack tool called rcrack. 
and using the rainbow crack files that are from the current directory, that's what the period means, we want to crack the hash, which is given as, in this case, we're going to say, hey, uh, rainbow crack, I, I don't know what this, what was used to, to create this hash. I want to know what it is. Can you crack it? And it says, okay, boss. You press enter on this and it starts crunching, crunching, crunching. And it's doing that whole, is this a match? Is this a match? It's taking it, breaking apart that digest saying, do I have this anywhere in this table? Do I have this anywhere in this table? Do I have this anywhere in this table? And it's going through and it's um, looking for matches of the pieces and then it assembles those pieces to come up with um, after uh, just 15 seconds. It says, okay, this was the, the hash that you gave me and this is the input text that will generate that hash. 15 seconds. Now, we know the, the components that went in here, but if, um, if you wanted to, um, if somebody is willing to uh, throw me a bone here, if you will generate a hash on, uh, on your end, if you can paste that hash into the chat for me, I'll grab it and I'll hash it on my system. We'll find out what your input is. Uh, remember, you've got five character limit on there if you want to throw one my way. And to recall again how to generate a hash, it's, there's the command there. And here's Joe's favorite. We got Astro. Astro's on here. Got to represent. Can't make it plural though. That'd make it too long, right? Okay, here's John. John's throwing me a bone here. So John says, okay, sucker, let's, I want to see you try and crack this one. All right, so I'm going to say, rainbow crack, I want you to crack John's hash, which is here. Oop, I pasted it right away and it took off. All right, so it's going through, it's crunching, it's crunching, it's crunching. Last time it took about 15 seconds. I've been getting about 15, 16 seconds for it to crack all of this. And now I don't, I don't and, and you don't know what John used on his uh, original input. So after about 15 seconds, it should drop out and say, okay, I found it. It is gonna be, drum roll <laughs> as we wait. It always feels like a long 15 seconds, doesn't it? We're used to things popping our way so quick. This one may take a little bit longer. Oh, it was six years. Oh, well, there you go. That thinks a lot, man. <laughs> <laughs> Derailed us. So that'll that'll actually cycle through. It'll go through all possible combinations, and uh, it won't be able to find it. So, um, can you come up with another one, John? Or someone else want to beat him to the punch here? There we go. We got you a new one. All right. Looking really close there. Is that the same? Look like the same hash there. Oh, it is. It is the same. Did you actually accidentally paste the same one? <laughs> if it doesn't work the first time, maybe it'll work the second time. Is that what we're doing? Give it a, give it a shot. Oh, that one's pasting it too. Uh, make sure you right click and copy when you're grabbing that. <clears throat> that or we've got some collisions going on there we go there's a new one all right <laughs> finally yeah fourth time's a charm um all right so we've put in uh john's new one on here and now we're sure aren't we john we're sure this is a uh, five character so it'll uh run through and crack it as we wait we kind of twiddle our thumbs there we go it's a secret it's a secret <laughs> So that was uh, John's input there. Um, I'm assuming you had an SEC, uh, R-E-T earlier. Um, so here is our input. So he put in secret and was able to hash that. And then, um, and we can confirm that by coming over to our MD5 and typing in the input that he gave us. S-E-K, if I can spell it right, R-T. And there we go. So that shows that the what the crack came out with is whatever the input is on there. Now, what if we come across, like, like I showed you earlier, if we come across the hashes.txt, how do we break all of these guys? 
Oh, great. So that's where you can go in and you can actually throw a file name at it and you give it a list of, of things to crack. And that one's going to be our crack using rainbow tables from the current uh, directory. I'm going to give you a list and that list is hashes.txt. And so when you run this one, this takes a little bit longer than 15 seconds because what you're doing is you're doing it on multiple ones but you'll start seeing them pop off as it cracks each of these on the different chains. So, um, and I'm not sure if, if uh, rainbow crack is multi-threaded, if it's um, faster computationally in that way, but um, you're, uh, you're able to then compare multiple um, lists on here. So where would you come up with a list of files like this? Where, where might you find hashes? On the, uh, on the Linux system in your slash etc or your etsy directory, you've got um, the, uh, on the etsy directory, we've got uh, a file called shadow and the shadow file has a list of MD5 um, hashes on there, uh, not MD5, uh, SHA-512 hashes. And so you'd have to generate a very large rainbow table to deal with SHA-512 digests and you would also have to make it for upper, lower, special characters, numbers. It has to be for all possible characters that, are, that a password could find. But if you know that a, that a user on the system has a password of, well, I, I saw them type it in, I saw they only made seven keystrokes, and you saw they were only on the letters, then you could only do upper and lower case, seven characters long, and you would generate a, a, a rainbow table for that particular, um, uh, for that particular use case. So um, then I could go through and I could try chewing through all potential users. Here we go. Now they're breaking. They all fell pretty quick once it got a uh, kind of sort of unwinding that chain. And so here it tells us, um, remember, we don't, we didn't see. Yeah. So Brittany's like, what the heck is all this? Um, so um, when we're looking at um, the, the outputs on here, so it tells us how long it ran for. It took 94 seconds to crack this list of files. These digests were all that Rainbow Crack was able to see. And it was able to determine these were the hash values, Tommy, Joe, Vacker, Ohio, Texas, and Cyber. So it got all of those and it, it, it's going to necessarily break them as long as we have a rainbow table that's large enough and none of those goes to over the maximum limit. Um, so sans.org, Mike says, has a number of references for passwords that can be used. Is that the one where it uh, tells you how long computationally it would take to crack, um, Mike? Or is it, are you talking about another resource? I've, I think I've seen one similar to that. Maybe it's Krebs that has that one. But um, that one's where you type in the password and it says it'll take, you know, 10 minutes or 10 seconds or 10 millennia to crack given today's current computational power. Um, Brittany says, uh, what the heck does this mean? When she runs, um, when she looks at the, uh, the MD5 uh, lower alpha, uh, is it when you're viewing it, Brittany? Um, so if we were to open the MD5 uh, file, it's actually all this gibberish. Um, it's, it's a binary file. And so it's all um, in a format that, that we wouldn't normally be able to read. Um, let me exit out of that. Um, so that's what the, uh, the the binary data looks like here. If you open it in a hex editor, it's not going to be uh, any more intelligible um, because all those all, it's all in a um, compressed format. And that's what it, when it's talking about a binary format, it's compressed. Um, they've got it compressed like fifty percent, I think. So that file is quite large. You're not going to actually be able to go there and see all of the individual chains. There is a website, I don't recall what it is, that shows you um, like MD5 uh, rainbow tables that's on there. It's telling you it's not sorted. Oh, did you run the, uh, the RT sort? That's where, okay, I see what you're saying now. Um, run that RT sort command. Whenever you run that one, that's going to go through and sort all the data, put it into a digestible format. Um, and then Mike's uh, back to Mike's point. He says, uh, yeah, it references the text files with lists of passwords. Um, 10,000 10, passwords on one of them. Yeah. And on the dark web, there are tons of those dictionary files that have all of that. So a rainbow table is slightly different though than a, than a dictionary attack. Uh, rainbow table is actually more of a computational shortcut. 
Uh, whereas a dictionary attack is like, this is literally what the word is and it's going through there. Um, the way the, the rainbow table works is it's breaking these off in little chunks and it's looking for matches of like, you know, four, two or four characters at a time saying, okay, well, there's a component, there's a component, there's a component. And if not, it rehashes it and rehashes it. So it's actually a, uh, kind of an algorithmic mathematical attack on, um, on breaking some of these hashes. The, the only catch is, is that it's different for each system. And so the, the defense against a rainbow table is to um, have as many different uh, salts as possible. And so um, if you have a cryptographic salt and the, it further encrypts the, the, the chain, it gives the final hash on there that can make it very difficult for a person to generate a rainbow table for, um, they'd have to generate rainbow tables for each individual user if they have different salts and different hashing algorithms based on that. Um, and, and to my point earlier, I talked about the, um, the file, I'm gonna cat this file, Etsy shadow. Uh, because we're a root, we can view this one. And if you look at this, uh, this account, this tells you the, expand that window there. This tells you the, uh, this is the hash of the student user that's on here. There we go. That part that's highlighted is the, is the, the hash for the user named student, but this is the salt that they use. And a salt is a, a word that you would add to the user's password and then encrypt that uh, with the hash. So the salt helps um, defend against, um, uh, you know, breaking the hash in different ways because um, that gets added to the password. So even if you know what the user's password is and you know they're using a 512 hashing algorithm, it's still not going to be a match. You have to know what the salt is on this one. So um, that is a quick brief look at, at Rainbow Crack tool that we've got. Uh, again, those are all, all the steps that, we've, that we went through are uh, outlined in the Rainbow Table attack PowerPoint. And it walks through both uh, manually creating the hashes that are on here. Um, if you do, if you manually create it by piping out to that, you need to make sure that you go through and remove um, any text after just the MD5 hash. Um, and then I also put that, that awk command down here at the bottom if you need reference to that. Um, and then going through and make sure you do that RT sort and um, then you can go through and manually generate a, a, an MD5, crack it this way. And that's how you crack an individual one. And then the, the list that we had is this one here. Uh, finally, the, that defense again, salt the passwords. Um, also there's a uh, concept called key stretching. And that's where you take a hash and you hash it. And you hash it multiple times. And that may vary depending on the user's name or something. Um, you know, so if you have student, you have seven characters on there. So maybe you're going to hash it seven times. Uh, Joe, three, so I'm only going to hash this three. And that's going to throw off the ability for me to generate rainbow tables on a system where we've both got student and a username Joe, and you've got a username Tommy that's only going to get hashed five times. Uh, it's going to throw off the rainbow tables that's on there. We also like to put this in the, put the student in the driver's seat, um, ask them, you know, so here's some examples of how to do it. You know, definitively, this is, uh, these are some of the, the known ways to defend against some kind of exploit. Um, how else might you be able to do it? And that's where the students can talk about, you know, perhaps there's policy or there's ways of safeguarding uh, usernames on a system so that uh, not anybody knows usernames to try uh, with a hashed password. Um, how do you protect your password file so they can't use a rainbow tag rainbow table attack offline and then come back onto your system. So different ways you can do all this. Um, rainbow tables uh, and cr cracking hashes uh, is a way that um, folks have, have used to be able to crack uh, different encryption schemes. If there's a, if something is a, a secure hash that's used as a password, um, you have to know what that password is. Rainbow table will crack it eventually. Um, and it's gonna be quicker doing that than it is to try and brute force it. Um, cycling through all of that or using a dictionary attack, something like that. Um, okay, and so Brittany wants to know, can we go back to the, uh, Canvas here and show you where all the courses are? Yeah, so um, the uh, all the different uh, lessons that we've got in here, it's in Canvas. Uh, this is whenever you get access to Canvas, you've got all these different courses that are in here. Uh, cyber literacy is an introduction to some kind of 
uh, basic concepts, get around programming, some simple programming uh, of robots, and then discussion of cyber concepts. And then cybersecurity course is where all of our uh, cybersecurity content is. When you click on that banner, it will take you in here to all of the different uh, lessons. And then um, you've got those teacher notes that explain the concepts and you've got PowerPoints and then uh, labs, case studies and so forth. Lots of stuff in here. Uh, don't be scared. It is intended to be a year long course, but prepared to, uh, it, it's all prepared so that students can take on the security plus exam at the end of the year. Um, so um, Octavia is asking, uh, do you have to, to access Canvas, uh, do you have to sign up? You know, so we, um, like I said earlier, we, everything that we do is funded by uh, DHS's CISA agency. So um, we do have to report back headcounts to them. And that's what the, the whole approval process is, um, is about, is to make sure you're a U.S. teacher. And um, so you get kind of thrown into a headcount that we report to them. I think it's quarterly or something like that. It's not mine or Joe's department, <laughs> yeah. um, but we just give, we just give them head counts. We're not giving them, you know, all of your personal information, but there you have it's, that. It's just, so they can probably find that stuff anyways. Right. <laughs> so uh, other questions, I guess we got just under 20 minutes. Um, there was a question that earlier. I forget who asked him. I forget what it was exactly, but how do we set up the accounts? Um, do we still want to talk about that or? Yeah, it's a great, uh, I'll share my screen again here. Um, so oh. the, or were you going to do it, Joe? Oh, no, I don't care. I'm, I'm just saying, uh, I don't know if that's what, if they wanted the uh, cyber range accounts, um, it'll be very similar to, I'm actually be the exact same as US cyber range. I guess if you want our image, um, we might have to get in touch to transfer from the US cyber range over to the Virginia, but it's very, very similar to the environments, not accounts. Yeah, so we might have to get in touch with, uh, either Raymond or tweaks and yeah. figure out if we can send an image over from um, the U S cyber range to Virginia. I'm sure they can. It's all the same, but also um, we could probably just walk you through our steps. It's just the DVWA install. I don't know if you want our background to cyber.org on that wallpaper, uh, but what Tommy says, DVWA install, we change the message of the day. We add those documents, which is a simple gift from GitHub. Yeah. And that's about it. Right. So, so we, don't, we honestly don't do much. So. Yeah. The, the documents files that we've got in here, like I said, I've got those uh, parked over here so that you can, um, you know, the students can come in here and learn, okay, if I, what's the difference between cat, you know, if I want to cat a file like Anthem, I can see the national Anthem star spangled banner. Um, but if I cat something really long, like Gatsby, the great Gatsby, all the text just blows through on the screen. So how do I do that? And that's where you can introduce them to something like, you know, using less, in order to scroll through that. And then they can use up and down arrows on there. Um, you can use, uh, you know, something like grep to go through and search for, you know, where does Daisy get used in gatsby.txt? Um, that's not correct. Uh, I think it's a dash H, I'm not doing it right. Um, so that we have the, those files in there in the documents directory. Um, like Joe said, we've got DVWA set up. We've got the lamp setup that's in here. Um, LAMP also installs a, an FTP server, um, and then you can use the FTP and Wireshark to actually see, um, the, you can see how the, uh, all of your actions are shown. I'm looking for the file on my desktop here, Joe. Um, so in Wireshark, um, you scroll in here and you can see, um, so on Windows, if you go through the FTP process, um, you log in as a, as a user and ask for the password, you type in the password. It doesn't show you on the Windows side, but it sends it across via FTP and type in LS and it shows you all the files. Well, then what you can do is uh, you go in and uh, in Wireshark, it'll actually show you what they typed in. The username is password, uh, username is student. The password is student. It's showing that because it's sending it in plain text. And then, uh, the, the user then listed out the files and they get to see all the files that come across here. They retrieved a file named robots.txt, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, because that's what they did over here on the FTP side. Um, it's just kind of diving into Wireshark, uh, setting that kind of stuff up. Um, 
that's one of the things that we have set up in here. Uh, but a lot of the tools that, that walk through um, how to, how to set all this stuff up, the DVWA, um, we have this uh, DVWA setup lab. Uh, Joe actually put this one together for us and um, kind of explaining what is DVWA and uh, how to install it. Um, you know, running the, the ZAMP installer, um, what all does that bring in? How do you set all that stuff up? Um, I think that's the only setup that we've really got in here. Isn't it, Joe, the only? DVWA and then um, the we Linux run a fun stuff. Update before we do everyone. Um, but the new 2021 should already have that or the update of that, that repository. Um, other than that, yeah, we, we really don't, we, we don't change that much of the dual environment image. It's just like three, four things. So, and if you take away our branding, I mean, we, there's almost nothing. And when we say brand, it's just a wallpaper and the message of the day. So, yeah. Um, good question. So, um, Eileen, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I don't know. I would assume they don't have access to your thing. I'm not 100% sure of um, how that works with your session later today. Um, you guys feel free to use this environment that we gave you. You'll have it until the end of next month. Um, use it as much as you would like. Um, we always recommend, especially if you're a Virginia teacher, to use what you would use in the classroom. So try and do this on your own Virginia so you get um, used to that. Um, Octavia, um, so yeah, as long as you request access um, to Canvas, we used to be able to sign you guys up from like being in a workshop, just send us emails. We got in trouble for that. You have to click the, you agree to terms and services. So we're not allowed to sign you up anymore. You have to go do it. I know that sounds stupid. It's just a requirement from our lawyers. Um, so yeah, you'll have access to it. Um, and you will be a student on Canvas. Um, we will not ever, or we are the teachers as in Tommy and I, and you guys are the students. It's just our way to hand out the stuff to you. Um, you can't upload, you cannot upload like the student roster and have it as a course. You've got to kind of download things and do it. We might be able to help you out there, give you a shortcut if you email us, but. Um, I think I think she's saying that, um, that she is a student uh, and not a classroom teacher. Um, uh, that's, the, that's the rub, I think. Um, uh, let's see, let us know. Um, here, I'll, I'll drop my email here again let us know we'll see what we can work out um get you access to that if you're studying for the um for yeah, the, we, we need to update it yeah um with your your new 2020 dual environment we we, we just haven't updated ours yet but when we roll out in august our new image we're already on what 4.0 tommy we've been doing this for two months <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. have it for that new uh new one that you guys did tweaks um and then we are big gun tweaks coming in yeah Phil, tweaks. Have you been here the whole time? I would have been nervous if I'd known. <laughs> um, uh, Eileen, on on your issue, will out of state people people be able to access the Virginia Cyber Range? That's that's all with the accounts set up that um, that y'all have for the uh, for the event this week. Um, out of state people should be able to access it um, with the. Uh, they should have access to Virginia Cyber Range. Usually it's, that's, you know, what side of the fence are you on? Are you on the Virginia Cyber Range VACR or are you on the U.S. Cyber Range? Um, uh, that's, that's all dependent on where, who's paying for it, right? So if you're a Virginia teacher, you're on VACR because that's free and paid for. If you're not a Virginia teacher, then um, there we go. Tweaks the way in and saying that he agrees. Um, so I'm giving the right answer here. <laughs> um, if you're, if you're out again, then. Um, can we ask Tweaks since you're here? I don't know if you can come off mute or whatever. Um, are they able, so um, if we have our image that we have copied on the U.S. side range, are we able to find a way to get that to the Virginia so that teachers can have it or no? Um, yeah, just, just work with me and I'll hook you guys up with DevOps and, and uh, we'll make sure it's okay with Dave and move it over. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Anything that we missed? If you if you asked us early and I skipped it, uh, Brittany asked. Uh, the email said you'll get a couple days for approval on that. That's just a kind of a boilerplate response. Um, we, we'll get those to you shortly. We've got folks back at the at the main office. Um, we're headquartered in Northwest Louisiana. We've got folks back there that are um, processing these accounts. Sometimes we get they get slammed. Uh, you know, we've got multiple things going on across the country. So we've got hundreds of people registering all at once. They're like, ah, oh, give us a couple of days. But um, with this size crowd, they should be able to get you through it just fine. 
Um, tomorrow we will be doing uh, kind of a show and tell. We'll be diving through some of those um, uh, case studies. Just kind of looking at the course. Today was kind of more a little bit more of a hands-on. Hope you enjoyed the activities that we did today. We've got plenty more in the course.